Stuff Podcast. I'm Jonathan Lack. And I'm Sean Chapman. And we are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. We're going to shoot the shit. Yeah, there's not there's not a big main topic to talk about this time. No. Um, so we're going to do a bunch of little things. Some of them are uh, going to be more serious than we usually maybe get into on this podcast in that there have been some dark and sad things going on in the some gaming and movie communities. Yeah. And we want to talk about that. But we also want to be silly and have some fun because there's enough dark shit in the world. So we're going to speculate about... Uh, we've, the, the Super NES Classic is coming out this week. So I'm going to do some wild speculation on the N64 Classic. There we go. One, because I just like to imagine what the fuck that thing would be. Then what is... is are they still going to make the analog stick out of hardened chalk? Yes. That's my main question for that. <laughs> and we're going to do some... We're going to talk about Destiny 2 a little bit more. To follow up on my thoughts on Metroid Samus Returns, which I have now beat twice. I had not even beat it once last week. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah. And yeah, we're just going to talk about stuff that's fun. So yeah, we actually just got off of, to talk about housekeeping, Sean, yep. you and I just recorded uh, the Doctor Who bonus podcast for the month. We did. On Tomb of the Cybermen. It was really fun. Yeah. I loved recording yeah, that one. It's a good podcast. It's a great Doctor Who story. If you haven't seen it yet, that's yeah. a good one to go to. It, I think that'll be coming out tomorrow from when you guys are hearing this. So you'll be hearing those out of order. But that'll be coming out for patrons. So if you go to patreon.com slash weekly stuff podcast. Uh, do the $5 level, that's it, and you can listen to that a week early, uh, and then we will get that into the main feed. That'll actually be, I guess, early October by the time that comes out, but we were a little late this month, but we'll be better next time when we do a third Doctor Story. Yeah. Um, so that'll all be fun. You can listen to that to hear what the third Doctor Story we're talking about is, but that was a blast. Uh, so yeah, that's housekeeping. Um, let's see, Mario 64 has started going out for the public. Yeah, it has. Um, we're going to have more episodes this week. Um, so to finish off, we're going to have episodes three and four this week, which four I still need to get to patrons, which means I actually still need to finish editing it. Been really busy. And then we need to shoot more Mario 64. Yes, we do. We need to, we need to put that one in the bed. There might, there might be a little break between um, some, some episodes of, of Mario 64 because there's a lot going on. Yeah. But that's okay. We'll figure it out. It's a fun show to shoot. And now, like, I have been getting... A good number of comments on moments where I've fucked up one of my favorite games of all time. So, it's fun, you know. Yeah. We all get know, our turn in the barrel. It's a really fun one to watch for me. You know, yeah, you sit I, back and see this, like, how are you going to handle the penguin? Yeah, so, you know, the, my, my little brother watches the Let's Plays um, as they come out public. I keep telling him, like, I can give you the videos. You <laughs> don't have true. to. Like, it's I like, can give you, you can get them totally unedited if you want. Like, you yeah. can just watch them. Yeah. They're right here. But no, but he always wants to watch them as they come out public on YouTube, uh, which is great. I like that he watches them. And he's basically just been coming into my room and just pointing at me and laughing for Mario 64, which is fair. I mean, you know? now you can appreciate that I don't do that to you while that happens. I'm trying to be very supportive. I have to tell you, Sean, the Mario videos, are on a technical level actually much simpler to edit than the Halo ones. They have taken me way longer because it's much harder for me to watch my own failings than to watch you mostly play Halo competently yeah. but once in a while have trouble. So there you go. Glimpse behind the curtain. There we go. All right. Um, but let's see. What do we have uh, next on the outline here? I opened the wrong document. Yes, let's go ahead and jump into stuff. So, Sean, that was our housekeeping. Let's yeah. talk about some stuff. What stuff do you have going on? Um, not a whole lot of stuff. I've been, you know, keeping up with my Destiny 2, just sort of like plucking away at that. It's a good game to just sort of like play a little bit every mm -hmm. day the way the Destiny 1 was. The one other thing is I started earlier today because I was like, oh, we're going to record a podcast. I need to have something else to talk about. If there's something I've been wanting to get back to for a while was No Man's Sky. Um, that earlier, I think it was earlier in August, they released a huge update for No Man's Sky that added a new sort of like story campaign sort of element to that game. Um, that was like the third of a series of really huge updates they've done since that game first came out. And I've always wanted to go back and see what a lot of those updates were. And I figured, oh, I've got a little bit of downtime here. I'll take a little break from Destiny and play some No Man's Sky. And I haven't played that much of it. I only kind of like got off the first planet and got my... Because I... I Made a new save because it had been a year since I played any of that game. So I was like, ah, I don't want all my old stuff. I'm going to have no idea where the fuck I am. So I started a new save. 
um, got off the sort of first planet, got my warp cell and, and hyperdrive and sort of gone to the next point in the galaxy. And I have to say, they have fucking added a lot of stuff to that game. Um, it, there's like building stuff now. You can, at some point, you can make vehicles. There's a whole other sort of uh, new different kinds of like huge cargo ships you can get and stuff like that. Obviously, I don't have any of that stuff yet, but I can sort of see it and see all the places they've added this stuff. The beginning of the game is much better at sort of giving you a sense of progression and a reason to go to some places. They have very clearly touched up a lot of the algorithms for how planets are put together and how animals are put together because they're a lot more sort of dramatic. I went to an icy sort of like winter planet that I had never seen before when I played the game when it came out last year. And overall, like I think it's something that if you bought No Man's Sky and kind of have fallen away from it and, and sort of haven't been paying much attention to it but still have it, like I think is 100% worth going back to because I was really impressed by my like 90 minutes to two hours of playing that game earlier today how much stuff they had added and how much more sort of like fully featured that game feels because i still really enjoyed it when it came out but i think there were obviously issues and holes in and how that game was built and this feels like like it, like the weird tragedy of if that game had been delayed for like nine more months or something which obviously would be been a huge ask um and this had been like the version of the game that first launched it would have, i think had a like a hugely successful launch that's obviously how not that's not how that played out. But if you have No Man's Sky, but and were burned from it and didn't like it and but did not give it back yet or something or bought it digitally, like one hundred percent go back to that game because it is really impressive what they've done and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, you know I need to do the same thing with Recore on Xbox One. Right. Yes. The, because because now they've released Recore the definitive edition, which is maybe the most pointed barbed version of definitive I've heard for something because basically they went in and finished the game yeah because Recore was kind of like for me what No Man's Sky was for you last year where yeah. you liked No Man's Score I would or No Man's Sky more than like the general I also like general... its score its score is very good they added more music with the That's good. most recent patch as well yes but you liked it more than kind of the average like con you know conventional wisdom did yeah. and I liked Recore a lot more than I think the conventional wisdom did but both were clearly unfinished games yeah. so I'd like to go back and try that too and, and this you know emerging trend of games that get finished a year later yeah so but yeah um hey it's a better late than never yeah yeah no and it's something that like i had kind of forgotten just how peaceful and relaxing no man's sky is as a game and there was it was something very nice as like oh yeah like this is a guy can just walk around and take pictures of animals and get plutonium like this is a very calming like i had kind of like a busy stressful week and it was like this is a really way to just nice way to decompress from all of that yeah yeah i'm just gonna float in space for five minutes <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and... Uh, oh, I had one piece of stuff to talk about here, and that was... Uh, I saw the new Kingsman movie the other day. Oh, right. Kingsman, the, the Golden Circle, and I need to say something about it before I forget what happened in the movie. Okay. Because it's it's very okay. Okay. My, my quick review of Kingsman, the Golden Circle, is if you liked the first movie, Kingsman, the Secret Service, you will probably enjoy this one and have fun with it, but you'll notice like it's not nearly as good. Okay. But worth seeing. It's fun. You know, I went to see it for like a five dollar matinee. Totally worth it. So, you know, it's it's worth two hours of yucks. Um, but then, if you were lukewarm to one of the many people who like viscerally disliked Kingsman: The Secret Service, Golden Circle will be nails on a chalkboard to you. Okay. So don't think that like maybe I'll like it more this time. You won't. You're not gonna like it. I do think it has things worth recommending. It's got a phenomenal cast. The first one did. This one does too. Julianne Moore is the villain this time. And I, she needs to be the villain in more movies. because yeah, she's good. You wouldn't normally think of Julianne Moore as the villain. But she's very good. Just basically kind of playing a Julianne Moore performance if she were crazy. But also like I could totally see her if they ever want to do a female reboot of Silence of the Lambs. Like reversed where she's oh. where you have female Hannibal yeah. and male like... FBI agent, she would make a great Hannibal. Yeah, they because should actually totally fucking do that. That would be, yeah, like, gender-bent version of <laughs> Signs of the Lambs. That would be fucking awesome. That would be fucking awesome, and she'd be really good in it because there's some connections to Hannibal Lecter in this movie, let's I say. I feel like there has got to be at least, like, one time there has been a staged, like, theater performance that is a gender-flipped version of... Silence of the Lambs. That must have happened at least once. Brian Fuller is still thinking of doing another Hannibal thing. I think that should be it. Mads Mikkelsen plays the cop. 
Yes. And Julianne Moore is Hannibal and just flip it. And now yeah. Mads Mikkelsen is like the good guy. <laughs> Maybe that was their plan for Silence of the Lambs all along for Hannibal. Like that's <laughs> totally plausible to me that that's where that show would have gone for another season. Like we're going to do Silence of the Lambs, but you're not going to believe how we do it. Yes. No, there's, there could be a lot of great ways they could do that. But yeah, anyway, Julianne Moore is so great. And I wish they actually used her a little more because she's a great villain. And the first movie had a great villain was Samuel L. Jackson giving the funniest performance of his career because he had a little lisp and it makes me laugh my ass off so anyway the villains in these movies are really good um, a lot of other good actors do we in, we are introduced to the statesman in this movie the american version of the kingsman they are not a tailor they are a whiskey manufacturer which okay. is great and you've got shanning tatum as tequila you got pedro pascal from game of thrones as um whiskey i think is that character's name and jeff bridges is in three scenes as champagne but he goes by champ and I liked that. Okay, Jeff, Bridges is, Jeff Bridges is great. Yeah. And just the statesman. Oh, you also have Halle Berry in there, and she's really good. So that's fun. Getting another, like, a James Bond performer in there, which is cool. Um, let's see. Who, and then you've got some of the returning actors. Um, honestly, as much as I love Colin Firth, and Colin Firth is a world treasure. He is a yes. wonderful person. Absolutely. He was so great in the first Kingsman. It's, this isn't a spoiler. It's in the trailers. He dies in the first Kingsman, yeah. and they had to bring him back here. And he's great in that first movie. I think bringing him back is the biggest mistake this movie made because it really strains the second act of the movie because his whole like resurrection and all this stuff really has nothing to do with the main plot with Julianne Moore. Mm -hmm. And it just, like, this movie is two and a half hours long. It's way too long. It's really meandering. Like, if you want to play the exercise, where are the act breaks? It's very hard because it's so meandering. And part of that, I think, is that I don't know if the movie justifies having Colin Firth in it enough when I actually think there could have been a much more interesting direction where you could take the main character, Eggsy, played by Taron Edgerton, and maybe another one of the young Kingsman agents from the last movie and put them together and maybe have that be more like a new generation coming rather than bringing Colin Firth back and kind of restoring the status quo. I think that's problematic. Colin Firth is fun in this movie. He's good. But I think they kind of waste him in some ways. And I think the resurrection plot... It is very... I love how pulpy it is of how they get through him getting a bullet to the head. It made me laugh very hard. Because it's the perfect kind of James Bondian explanation for that. It's basically they have a special gel that goes in his head. And he, it's hilarious. But it's great. Um, but I think that might have been a mistake. But you do have also returning is Mark Strong. Who played Merlin in the first movie. The codename Merlin. Who's like the, the tech guy. Like the Q of this universe. And Mark Strong is just one of the best and most underrated actors. I love him. Matthew Vaughn, the director, clearly loves Mark Strong. He has the best scene in this movie. And like, there's a scene in this movie with Mark Strong near the end that makes the whole movie worth the price of admission and is fantastic. And I want Mark Strong to just get his own film series because he's sure, so yeah. great. There was that period where he like played villains in everything. Uh -huh. And now he plays, like I think in part because of the first Kingsman, like very warm characters. And he's great in whatever mode. He's just a great actor. So you have a lot of stuff like that. I liked, I think Taron Egerton is good in this. Everyone, everyone's good in this movie. Um, it's very meandering, as I said. It's too long. I think it tries to be subversive in some of the ways the first movie I found interestingly subversive because it's very much... The first movie is all about kind of taking the James Bond logic to its natural endpoint extreme. And it's not always in good taste, but I found it fun and interesting. This movie, I think, does that with less success. It tries to do an interesting thing where it tries to explore some of, I think, the the romantic and sexual politics of being a James Bond-esque secret agent where the main character, Eggsy, is actually in a committed relationship now with the woman he got with at the end of the first movie as like a fling. Mm -hmm. And I wish they had committed to that more fully or done something better with that because it feels half-hearted and ultimately might raise more gender and sexism problems than it solves there's a scene if you've seen the movie you know what it is where they kind of try to address you know the sleeping with a mark kind of thing that secret agents have to do in all these movies and i get what they're going for i think the movie's own sense of like we need to push this further undermines it completely so kind of a wash on that um and and you know there's some other things that, that julianne moore's character her whole plot evil plot basically she's a drug dealer and she has this plot where all the drugs she's put out in the world, she has created this virus strain that... I'm spoiling a little bit of the movie here, but sure. whatever. It's been out for a weekend, and you, you're not going to see it. So. No. Uh, but anyway, I haven't seen the first one. Yeah, so. So, but anyway, so, and so the whole idea is that she's, gonna, she's going to blackmail like the world where she's going to make the world decriminalize drugs, so she will send the antidote out to this poison she's put in her drugs. And it, it raises these issues, and the film consciously raises these issues of like... 
you know, that recreational drug use we shouldn't view as such a villainizing thing as we do. And that's a very complex, loaded topic. Uh-huh. It also has racial implications the movie does not get into in the fucking slightest and all right. these things. And like, and there's like this whole... Economic implications, yes, yeah. There's this whole subplot where the president of the United States just wants to let them all die because they're junkies and he can get rid of them all in one fell swoop. Which is also something like... I actually think you could take that a step further and have do something interesting with that, yeah. but you have to really go for it. And all of that, like the movie... Kingsman at its best, at the platonic ideal of Kingsman, it is too silly a movie series to deal with a theme that complex, and it just shouldn't be broached, and I thought that was the grossest part of the movie. Okay. So, problematic. Overall, again, if you liked the first one, this one's worth going to see. It's got some fun stuff in it. There's some good action, and again, Mark Strong makes the movie in at least one great scene. Um, But yeah, I'd be... I wonder if there's really enough gas in this tank to do a series of Kingsman movies, like if they want to do a third one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we if we want to go to another James Bond knockoff, although this one is much more kid friendly, this is from my youth that I'm remembering. This is not dissimilar to the Agent Cody Banks series, <laughs> okay, which was okay. You, you I was that not. Was the I was, yeah, of all yeah. the things you're going to say, that was the last thing I would have ever thought. Whereas of. Whereas a kid, the first one was pretty cool. You know, Frankie Muniz gets with Hilary Duff, and that's cool. But then the second one, like he goes to London. Was that an actual theatrical release, or yes. was that was just a, it was, so it was not a Disney original movie? No, no, no. Those are both theatrical releases by MGM, I believe. But anyway, and then the second movie was like really kind of lame and disappointing. And I'm sure if I watched them now, they'd both be lame and disappointing. Oh, yes, yeah. but it speaks to that's just one analog. Cause there's a bunch of the James Bond knockoffs. Yeah. You can frequently make the fun James Bond knockoff for movie one, and if you try to do a sequel, it falls apart. And I think Kingsman might have fallen into that. It's like one of the reasons why Galaxy Quest is so beloved as a Star Trek knockoff right. is they never made Galaxy Quest 2. Yeah, because it's like... You know what I mean? Yeah, because there's usually not enough material to do it twice, right? Yeah, yeah. Unless you're going like super deep with your references. Yeah. Yeah. Now, instead of Agent Cody Banks, you know, I could have referenced the Alex Ryder books by Anthony Horowitz, but the books are actually pretty fun and they only made one movie and it bombed so they never got to the sequel stage. So anyway, James okay. Bond knockoffs are one of my favorite sub weird subgenres. So this is why I can go deep with okay. them. I have also just Wikipedia Frankie Muniz because when you said Frankie Muniz, I was like, he's a NASCAR driver now. Yeah, in two thousand. So here's I'm just going to read to you the second paragraph of his Wikipedia article. In two thousand three, he was considered one of Hollywood's most bankable teens. In quotations. In 2008, he put his acting career on hold to pursue an open wheel racing career. He competed in the Atlantic Championship. So that's already crazy. And his picture on Wikipedia is him in his like wiki, uh, racing outfit. The best part is this last sentence. In 2012, he joined the band Kingsfoil as a drummer. He left the band in 2014. <laughs> so if you... Hey, when I was a Frankie kid... Frankie Muniz watched, that's where he's at. When I was a kid, I loved Frankie Muniz. Big Fat Liar, fun movie. He was in uh, Malcolm in the Middle. Good show. Sure. So I will give you actor. Malcolm in the Middle. Like, all the other ones are movies, like, like Agent Cody Banks and Big Fat Liar are the two movies I can very specifically remember being, like, seeing at a sleepover at someone's house and feeling like, why are we watching this movie? Like, that's the sleepover at the friend's house that you're like, I'm not friends enough with you usually to, like, this is not... This is a bad idea. Like, we're not close enough friends to do this. Like, when I slept over at this other kid's house, we watched The Matrix. When I slept over at this other kid's house, we watched Princess Mononoke. With you, I watched fucking Agent Cody Banks. This friendship's going nowhere. We need to cut this off right now. That's that's what the okay, uh, Frankie Muniz movie is Let me make me. a... Here's another uh, Jim Bond knockoff reference I can do. Because I think Kingsman, it's a tradition. Johnny English, the movie with Rowan Atkinson. Okay. Johnny English 1 is a fun parody kind of thing. Johnny English... Two, which came they out ten two? years. They did. It came out ten years later. It's called Johnny English Reborn. We watched half an hour of it in the theater, and I walked out because <laughs> okay. um, it was really bad. And there were people behind us talking, and we just couldn't stand it. So anyway, Kingsman I think falls in that tradition of you get your one spy movie knockoff thing, and it's fun. Don't make a sequel. Would you count Spy Kids in there? Does Spy Kids, or is that like a bit too far afield? Spy Kids is too far afield because Robert Rodriguez is a crazy person, yeah. and it's not really. I mean, Spike Kids One is about like an evil toy maker, right? Like, I think so. With, like yeah. Alan Cummings is the villain. It's so different that I don't think it's like really dinosaurs and it. shit. Yeah, yeah. There was another series in the back of my head I was thinking about that has maybe made it work longer term. Yeah, Spike Kids, it's close enough, but and but the sequels to Spike Kids were okay. Like, if you liked the first one, 
Two was okay. Spy Kids One was a decent kids movie. It's a very good kids movie. That. Like a lot better than Agent Cody Banks. Yeah, Spy Kids Two has some fun stuff. I mean, they all have Danny Trejo and Antonio Banderas. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. Spy Kids Three has Elijah Wood in it for one scene. It does. It has. Uh, it has Sylvester Stallone as the villain. <laughs> it does. You're and he, right, lear- it and does. he learns the power of love. Uh-huh. I like. You know, they're good kids movies. You got to get the three D glasses though. Yeah, there's a scene in that movie where I I love how shamelessly Spy Kids 3D used 3D. Where there's a scene where Antonio Banderas he gets a call that like his kids need him and he's working in a lab with like he's getting the cure to cancer and so he just goes, "My kids need me." So he takes off his glasses and swings them and breaks all of his chemistry equipment so that the glass can fly at the audience. No explanation why he did that. It's just that Antonio Banderas looked cool doing that in 3D, and I get it. Yeah. I this, think I think we're identifying though then where the Kingsman series needs to go for the third movie. Antonio Banderas. Antonio Banderas and like 3D, but like good 3D. And by good 3D, I don't mean that atmospheric bullshit we got <laughs> since Avatar. I mean fucking just throw shit into the camera, but it's like you know a rated R movie, so it can be you know penises or something. I don't know. When I said this podcast was going to be loose. I meant it. Where, yeah, I mean, we're, this is where it's just shooting the shit. Like you said, we're, we're unscripted because we usually write scripts for these if people didn't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's no main topic to anchor any of this. No. All right, let's move on to some news and stuff. Okay. All right. Do, Bef- do you, you don't want to talk about Asian Cody Banks for another hour? No, I just, I can make the deep cuts. Look, there's a lot. You totally can. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, here's a movie that might be good, might be not. We got a trailer this week for the new Tomb Raider movie. Starring yes, Academy Award winner Alicia Vikander. Yeah. I think that's the first time a video game movie has gotten to advertise in the trailer with Academy Award winner. You're starring, yeah. I mean, you would with Michael Fassbender if the Academy Awards ever recognized him for Assassin's Creed, but sadly they haven't yet. So, no go for poor Michael Fassbender. But Alicia Vikander is the new Tomb Raider. She is Lara Croft. Yeah. And I watched this trailer, and I'm not going to say like it looks like a great movie. Yeah. It looks like a decent movie. It looks like a, like a movie I'd go pay $10 to see. And I know that's a low bar, but for video game movies, it cleared that bar. Yeah, like, the thing I found most interesting about the trailer was that it, like, it looked like a pretty close adaptation of the new Tomb Raider game. The Crystal like, Dynamics like, ones, yeah. like, yeah. particularly, like, they were, like, basically quoting specific action scenes from that first game with, like, the rusted old plane and stuff like that. Yeah, and you have, I mean, she has, like, the, the, the hatchet thing she uses yeah. to climb with from those games. They mentioned Trinity, which is the evil organization from the new games. The stuff with her dad feels very pulled from, yeah. particularly Rise of the Tomb Raider. Have you played that yet? Uh, no, I okay. keep, keep on meaning to get around to it, but 500 video games keep on yes. coming out. <laughs> it's really good. Sadly, that's what happened to it for a lot of people. Yeah. But it's a great game. No, it looked like, Alicia Vikander looks like kind of perfect casting for this yeah. version of Lara Croft, which is great. Um you know, you've got Dominic West as her father, which is really cool. Um, Walton Goggins is the bad guy. Nick Frost is in one scene. Yeah, in the scene that's like clearly the last scene in the movie, like that scene where she has the two pistols, and it's like this is the last. This is this is, might even be the scene at the end of the credits. This is so the last scene of this movie. I can't believe you put this in the trailers. I mean, it's fine because it's yeah. not like giving the plot away, but it was so like. This is there's there's no way this is anywhere else in that movie because it's like her getting her pistols and like the whole Tomb Raider outfit. Yeah, that's the end of that movie. But I wanted to mention this trailer because again, I don't know if this is going to be a great movie or anything, but most of the time when I watch a trailer for a video game movie, any video game movie, it feels hollow and soulless and pandering. Yeah, and then you actually see the movie and it's somehow even worse than that, which is from all accounts what the Assassin's Creed movie was, for instance. Yeah. This movie actually, like, as a big fan of the two recent Crystal Dynamics games, this looked kind of like, like, if I read a book that I love, and then I see a trailer, and it's like, like, It, if you saw the trailer for It, and you loved the book, and you're like, that seems like they got it. That's what I got out of this trailer, is like, that looks like the Lara Croft I know and love. I like the setup here. She's going around and exploring, and there's big, crazy action, and she's doing climbing and archaeology and all this cool shit. And it's like, yeah, that's what I like. It looks like a good cinematic representation of that. Alicia Vikander seems like perfect casting. It's got a good supporting cast. Like, this feels like a movie that, at least from this two-minute trailer, was made by people who played and enjoyed those video games. And again, I know that's a low bar, but it's a bar that seemingly has never been cleared. Right. In yeah. in live action Hollywood video game adaptations. Yes. So you have to put the Persona 3 animated movies to the yes, side. Yes. Because those are still whenever I'm hearing people on like a podcast or something talking about how there's no good video game movies and my like there are exactly four and they are very good. 
No, but they're it, very hard to that, see. That's but what, one of them is on Netflix, and it is not the first one, and it is still there. I checked just the other day. How is that? Things leave Netflix every day. How is that still there? Persona Three, the movie number two, Midsummer Night's Dream, is still on their ads of yesterday when I was checking if they had all the episodes of Little Witch Academia up there, and they do now. Okay, wonderful. Can't wait for our Little Witch Academia podcast. It was. It's a very good show. Okay, no, but um, what were, what what the fuck were we were talking about? Uh, Tomb Raider. Well, I know we were talking about yeah. Tomb Raider. I forget what point I was uh, making. Video game movies. Video, yeah. That's why I always qualify it with Hollywood video game movies. Because yeah. Persona, very much not Hollywood. But True. yes. Um, so I don't know. Like, this went from being something where I was like, I'll wait and who knows, to I watched that trailer I'm like, sure, I'll go see it. Yeah. Doesn't mean I'll love it, but I'll go see it. Yeah, it has piqued my interest enough, particularly in that, like, I just found it really interesting because it, it did not occur to me that video game movies almost never sort of like directly visually quote what they're like adapting yeah. in a way that like it's just weird because video games are a visual medium at their core like you have to see them to interface with them and so it's weird that video game movies like the closest they get is like when doom the movie has the first person sequence or whatever like that's the closest you get is like kind of approximating the visual imagery of the thing whereas like this is again it's like directly like referencing her like the way she jumps off the ship into the water in the trailer and the way she jumps onto that plane and the plane starts to sink like those are all like directly you could look at like those action sequences from the video game and look at where they shot that in the trailer and if you like rotated the camera in the right way in the video game you could basically replicate that shot you know and, and alicia vikander has pretty much the exact costume that yeah. lara has in the in the first of the the reboot games so just things like that it's also kind of interesting to you know tomb raider back in like the year 2000 was like the only big video game movie for yeah. years the the uh, angelina jolie one and you know that movie feels like such a relic but also early tomb raider game tomb raider games feel like such a relic yeah because it's all this, you know, very obviously overt sexualization of Lara and all these pr issues. And it's nice that, like, this does feel like part of why the new games are such good source material is they found a way to modernize Lara for the video game landscape and make her feel like a good character and not masturbation material for right. teenage boys. And it's like, okay, and the movie found a way to do that too. This doesn't feel like a retread of what we've already done with, you know, the, the Angelina Jolie movies. Which yeah. I, I think most people have forgotten about, except as like pop culture relics. Yeah, I, I always forget that those movies ever existed. It's the same thing. If I always there forget were that two. I, I always forget that they made Tomb Raider movies, and I always forget that they're like the Resident Evil movies are technically those are technically video game movies. They it have doesn't seem to do like with the games, it, but they are technically video game movies. It's one of those when you talk about video game movies, like I think of like now Assassin's Creed or like Doom or Prince of Persia, like those ones. And then it's like, oh right, they made two Tomb Raider movies that were like successful enough that they kind of entered a weird part of the pop culture lexicon. And then those Resident Evil movies that they've made five hundred of, they and every single one they've said is the last one in like the trailers they've said they're the last one because that's the only access of, of information access I have of those movies. And as far as I know, they're just going to keep on making them forever. It's a it's a bizarre thing. It's a weird it's a weird world. Video game movies, but again, there are four good ones. Yes, there are four good ones. We reviewed all of them on the podcast. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, I have a playlist where you can just find all our Persona 3 chats in one playlist. There we go. And I even have a mega playlist for all of our Persona chats, period. And it's really long. I assume it would be. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, all right. Let's move on. So our next two pieces of news are sort of discussions. One is fun, and that will be our reward for getting through the one that is hard. Okay. Okay? The one that is hard, on my outline, it just says... Racism on YouTube and sexism in movies. This is a reference to a trend that obviously is not new. Race, YouTube has always been racist, <laughs> and movies yeah. have always been sexist. But it has and, come and vice versa. Vice versa, yeah. yes. Uh, and and it has come to a boil lately, though, um, because PewDiePie proved once again that he is a flaming racist on the internet yeah. and a horrible person. But we still give him things, and I don't know why. So that happened. And to me, like, I didn't bring that up on the podcast because it's, like, so self-evident. I don't... Right. I didn't quite know what to add to it. But I think the more you see the cultural context... I mean, we're recording this on the day that players in the NFL all took a knee because Donald Trump was an asshole. Yeah. And uh, wanted to silence Colin Kaepernick and instead made everyone in the league imitate him. 
right. things. So, you know, this is all part of an ongoing cultural conversation. And, of course, the sexism movies thing is also important. All of this, to me, also, like, the Donald Trump thing you can't ignore, that we yeah. have a racist and sexual predator in the White House. And so they're all coming out of the fucking woodwork. But, you know, the thing with the movies right now, if you have not been... It's been blowing up film Twitter and, and film websites and stuff that... Um, to recap, I'll try to do this as cleanly as yeah. I can. It's hard. Because I feel like there's... there Because there was like... There's the thing that happened very recently and there was another thing that's About, like okay. slightly more yeah. recent. So I believe it was late last year or early this year. Um, there was a writer for the Alamo Draft House uh, for their, their like online writing division. They have a little magazine and stuff called Birth Movies Death. His name Devin Faraci. He'd been on the scene forever. It was a pretty open secret that Devin Faraci was an asshole and he was combative online and he was probably not good in his relations with women. And then it came out much more explicitly because uh, he kind of crossed the line and, and women just started um, accusing him online um, much more openly than they had before. And uh, he copped to it and resigned. That he had basically, he had sexually harassed a lot of women online in chat and things like that, and in person, I believe, as well, um, at events uh, and whatnot. So he uh, apparently left the Draft House and Birth Movies Death. Tim League, the head of the Alamo Draft House, and by extension, also the head of Fantastic Fest. These are all going to become important. And one of the major figures in the Austin film scene, where a lot of this comes from, kind of confirmed Devin was gone and said they were going to try to make amends for this. Well, it came out last week through a Hollywood Reporter... Or, well, like two weeks ago, it's been an ongoing thing, through a Hollywood Reporter article and then some more stuff that um, Devin Faraci had, in fact, not left Birth Movies Death. He had continued to be on the payroll. Um, well, he, I guess he had left Birth Movies Death. He was still doing copywriting for the Draft House and for Fantastic Fest. And this had been kept a secret, but it was, again, an open secret among employees at the Draft House because the Draft House is a wide nationwide chain now, a lot of employees, and they would see him, like, CC'd on emails and stuff. Um, and Tim League had been keeping it a secret, basically, that he had kept this guy on the payroll on the down low. It came out. Devin Faraci left again. Tim League made an apology again. But all of this rang... rang uh, Understandably hollow yeah. because you lied about keeping a sexual predator or sexual harasser at least employed, and that's a really shitty thing to do. Yeah. Now, on top of this, uh, so fan th this had a big impact uh, on Fantastic Fest, which is the Austin Film Festival um, hosted by Tim League and the Alamo Draft House. Um, people were pulling out of Fantastic Fest. Um, you also had uh, one of the main organizers, uh, programmers at Fantastic Fest. He resigned as soon as he heard about this because he was outraged. He did not know Faraci was working for it, and he did not feel comfortable working there anymore. Um, and then we also started hearing rumblings that Ain't It Cool News, which is run by a guy named Harry Knowles, one of the oldest film blogs on the internet. You have probably heard of them before at some point yeah. if you followed film on the internet. Uh, also based in Austin, Harry Knowles was a co-sponsor of Fantastic Fest. They had pulled out of Fantastic Fest for reasons we couldn't quite understand. And then, I don't even know who published this last piece, I think it was Variety, uh, had a uh, revelation that Harry, or maybe it was, no, it was Vulture, I think. I don't remember. Someone of the sites yeah. um, had a revelation that Harry Knowles uh, had also um, sexually harassed women in person, like groping and things like that. Um, and someone had basically talked to this journalist to try to get that story out there. And then more stuff again. As, as soon as you get one accusation, obviously more come out because yeah. people feel more emboldened, and they should, to tell their stories and, and let people know who these people are. And, and it seems Harry Knowles has a pattern of doing this over the last 20 years. Uh, and Tim League is all buddy-buddy with this guy, too. Um, what it speaks to... There's many, many things to get into here, obviously. Yeah. What it speaks to, obviously, is a very toxic, misogynist culture and sexist culture um, in film and in film coverage specifically. Because this is not talking about filmmaking or Hollywood this is talking about film coverage and distribution with Tim League being a very influential figure in both. In the Alamo Draft House, you know, Harry Knowles being a very influential figure in the online film writing community and how much women are erased and mistreated in all of this. And it is sad and disgusting and I think people are, you know, working out their feelings on this in different ways. Some people saying they want to boycott the Draft House, some people saying Fantastic Fest should be shut down. You know, I have thoughts on all these things. I think all of these reactions and more are valid. You know, I think some of these people have been doing really despicable things. It is also absolutely true what has been said that you can't just take Devin Faraci, Harry Knowles, and Tim League and kick them out and say we're okay now. There is a culture around this that is really toxic. And that's why I think I draw the line in my head to the racism on YouTube thing. Because this specific incident was all about PewDiePie. But the fact that he feels emboldened to say the N-word right. in a stream 
speaks to something in gaming culture that is much more corrosive and all of this is part of what's going on in the world right now and it has many wide-ranging implications um, and I think I wanted to talk about it because I got to a point where I had tweeted about this a couple times but this is not something I can easily sum up in 140 characters right because um, because the basics of it obviously PewDiePie despicable what Tim League and Farachi and Harry Knowles did despicable awful shouldn't have their jobs those things but there's then there's below, beneath the surface you know because right. there's a million things that come from that uh, and that's what I wanted to dive in here and again if we get through this discussion we get to talk about something silly yeah so before we move on to sort of like really getting into it now, I think let me take like the PewDiePie, the video game side of okay. it, because there's also like a basically this whole year long spanning thing with that as well. Um, Did I do an okay job summarizing? Yes, yes I think <laughs> very yeah, hard. That, that is all from what I remember. That's all accurate with the Farachi stuff and then the Harry Knowles stuff. So this like like you, you it's mostly this year with this youtube stuff but pewdiepie has had criticism about him for a long time if you don't know who pewdiepie is he's basically the biggest youtube let's player that i mean the basic the biggest youtuber by extension from that um on youtube like millions and millions of like 13 million or something fucking ridiculous subscribers hugely influential in that scene he's like a bit he's basically our age so he's like in his mid 20s which means he's a bit weirdly like a bit too young for us like when we were into like internet culture because you watch someone who's a little bit older than you typically so like we were watching like red versus blue rooster teeth kind of stuff when yeah, he yeah. was like kind of coming up in let's plays yeah i've never watched a pewdiepie video me neither uh, in completion i've seen yeah. the clips when he says the n-word or something yeah so so it's like it's something that i'm not sort of while i do like let's plays and i watch let's plays not like that's like younger than me in a weird way and so i've never really engaged with that stuff and i've never seen his videos but he's faced criticism for years now for like usually it's sort of like rape humor of like by rape humor i mean he plays horror games and screams oh, i'm getting raped while well, a monster attacks him is basically the substance of the joke he's a, he's a great comedian uh like just a great crafter of comedy and humor and jokes it's really well done sarcasm if you can't tell yeah so so but he's faced criticism about that stuff for a long time and then earlier this year, I believe it was the Washington Post um, put out a story that sort of like basically talked about how there's a lot of like weirdly prevalent anti-Semitic and like Nazi-based humor in some of his videos. That might have been the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal. That's right. Because right. he yeah. he had like a public campaign against them. Yeah, it, yeah. So and so there were a couple of videos where he was like basically dressed up as Hitler and did this stuff. I think the biggest one that was like. The sticking point is a video. I forget all the specific details of this, but basically he used some sort of like Kickstarter-esque online service to pay some people, I think that were living in like India, um, to hold up a sign that said death to all Jews, that these people in India, I believe like didn't even speak English. So they didn't know anything of what that sign was, but he basically like paid them five bucks to do that and then made a video and like laughed at it. And that was when it was like, that's like, that's... Mm, that's not there's no joke there there's no or like the joke you're making is like it, how funny it is that you can pay someone in a third world country to hold up a sign that has an anti-semitic joke on it like that's if you're like even cutting this it's not a joke, joke though it's just an anti-semitic sentiment yeah anti-semitic yeah. sentiment thank you like on it like there's no there's nowhere you slice that scene and that like video nowhere is it good it's bad all the way down right um, and so then the Wall Street Journal sort of broke that story, which meant that Disney, that had a very short, very short-lived partnership with PewDiePie, they had a video with Disney. Through Maker. Yeah, which through is Maker. Dead. Disney was like, fuck this shit, which was a opening salvo in what has been a year-long thing of advertisers basically pulling out of YouTube for a whole number of different reasons. Because he's not the only one. Yes, he's not we the only one. We learned about a lot of people with anti-immigrant and other sentiments. Yes, yeah. So... So that happened, then, as you were saying earlier, PewDiePie then basically waged a weird campaign against the Wall Street Journal with a series of videos, like, creating, for me, like, I feel like fabricating this kind of culture war between print media and online media that just speaks to the insecurity of PewDiePie to me of, like, I don't think print media gives that much of a shit. I think they were just breaking the story because it's a legitimate story. So, so print media, it's the Wall Street Journal. They're fine. Yeah, like, I don't think, like, I feel like they're secure enough in the position they're not afraid of PewDiePie. Like, that's, you know, you can disagree with that reading of it, but that's very much how I feel. The Wall Street Journal is a fucking conservative publication. Yeah. And they're calling out your racism. Maybe you're on the wrong side. Yeah. So, so PewDiePie made a lot of like weird videos and just perpetuated this weird culture war after that then i think the other big one was john tron who is another big youtuber that again i haven't seen any of his videos 
Like he, and like John Tron is actually he's not as big as PewDiePie, but his stuff is like super fucking crazy out there. Like it's really bad. He's really bad, and and he has quite a few different arms. Like you yeah. know, one of the things his studio does is Digino you know Gaming, yeah, which I love. Um, and this all, and I wanted to talk about that because this all gets to the point where we okay we don't watch PewDiePie, but what happens when you know someone or something you like is tainted by there's someone involved in it at some level, direct yeah. or indirect. Who turns out to be a flaming racist or sexist or something. Yeah. And it's it's something worth talking about. But yeah. You know. Also, like along this stuff, as I'm thinking about it, a good resource for some of this stuff is um Patrick Klepik's reporting on waypoint.vice.com. Some really good stuff yeah, there. He's sort of followed along. Like he has a really great um article that's sort of like a more like almost like kind of like a blog post thing that's like more frank discussion about like I think the the headline is really good. It's basically like, what do you do when your children's watching a racist on YouTube? It's basically the headline. It's some good stuff there. So so then John Tron, like his is all like this like really extreme, like alt-right, far right-wing rhetoric about like anti-immigration stuff. Like as bad as fucking PewDiePie is, fucking John Tron shit is nuts. Well, because, okay, here's the difference. PewDiePie is just an idiot who uses racism for humor, which is awful. Right, it's yeah, yeah. John Tron has bottom. this like direct, like ideology. intense ideology, like yeah. behind all of that that is very clear, and he is not afraid to sort of like bring that ideology out. That's one of the many things about Donald Trump and the alt right movement is it's become so apparent and so mainstream that it allows someone like John Tron to feel empowered to sort of like just go crazy in a way that like normally they would hide that shit. It's you know, and you see that with like the riots in Charlottesville and all that stuff. So then now, like, bringing that up to where we are right now, um, a week or so ago, about two weeks ago, PewDiePie had a video where he was playing, it was like a live stream he was doing on tr- on Twitch, um, where he was playing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, the, the, the like, online multiplayer shooter of the day. And so much Player Unknown Battlegrounds news lately that really makes me want to play that wonderful game. <laughs> yeah, like, whatever. Let's talk about that. Yeah, but, so, so, PUBG, which is, like, how it's referred to, because it's much easier to say, he was playing PUBG, And, like, trying to shoot some guy on a bridge, and he couldn't shoot him very well. And so then he basically just said, oh, that fucking N-word. But he didn't say the N-word. He, like, he didn't say, quote, the N-word. He said, actually, that word in a way that was really, like, oh, oh, man, that's really bad. And immediately after he says it, he's like, oh, that, that fucking asshole. And then, but he doesn't, and you can tell that he realized... I really shouldn't have said that on a fucking live stream where I can't edit that out. But he didn't apologize for it immediately. He didn't backpedal for it at all. And it wasn't until like two or three days later after like this really blew up that he he put out an apology video. This is like the fifth fucking apology video he's had to put out this year. It, that's just like, uh, if you were very sincere about this apology, you would have made it in that live stream, dude. Because it's like he live streamed for like an hour or something after he, he made that comment. Yeah, you would stop playing... Yeah. You would probably shut down the stream and figure out something to yeah. do. And then and then also like I mean in live streams since then he has basically made similar comments and and used similar language um kind of playing like jokes off of the fact that he did that in the first place that then has not become more widely publicized in the way that really makes his apology feel it always already felt disingenuous because of his history. It then like makes it like feel especially disingenuous because he has it does not feel like he has sort of considered that at all. So focusing on the behavior at all. Focusing on the PewDiePie thing for a second. Yes. Sean, you and I, look, we all have, we can admit it, we've all said things we regret on the internet. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was 13 years old once. Yes. I'm a 25 or 24, yeah. almost 25 year old adult man now. Yeah. We've been playing games all our lives. We've been playing online but made it much of our lives. We've said things we regret. Um, Sean, at any point in your life, have you called someone the N-word online? No. No, yeah, no, that's never, that hasn't, as he said, that's never slipped out for me, which I think is the language no. he used. That Let alone, slipped out. and here's the thing, if PewDiePie was a 15-year-old kid or something and said that, still be awful. Yeah. But, still be but unacceptable. It would be understandable. Because you would, yeah, you can see someone who is inundated with this shit and is being an idiot and they're growing up and it's like, okay, you should know better, but hopefully this is a learning experience. Still unacceptable. Yeah. When you're an adult who makes millions of fucking dollars and has a responsibility as a creator, it's not just unacceptable, it's disqualifying from your profession. I mean, yeah, it's the kind of thing that if, like, Stephen Colbert did that on his, on, like, yes. show, like, 
She would be fired immediately. Like, she would be fired well, before that fucking show finished airing. Stephen Colbert... I, Bill Maher did it. And he... No consequences. Bill Maher did that... Li- I mean, he didn't call someone the N-word, yeah. but he used it in a joke. Right, yeah. Stephen Colbert would have... Stephen Colbert would resign because he's a good person. Yeah. And has scruples. That's the thing, though. I don't know if there are consequences anymore. That's a fair point. And that's what yeah. pisses me off, because that's actually also worth roping into this, is that Bill Maher just fucking said the N-word on HBO... Not in like the sense of like if someone says it on the wire, right? No, in his fucking talk show, and so that's the thing. Yeah, but yeah, no, you're right. In general, most media companies would have higher standards yeah. for that. I mean, because because also HBO is a slightly different thing than like CBS, right? Yeah, yeah. That like that if you were, but like what PewDiePie is is he's like he's the CBS of YouTube, right? Yes. Like he's the most mainstream ass YouTuber there is. He is like tens. Over 10 million subscribers. Like, that's a huge audience that watches him, that, like, pays attention to what he does. Again, most of them are younger. Most of them are teenagers. It's like he has a very direct responsibility. And it's not, like, he's not a teenager. It's the kind of thing if I think of back when, like, you know, I was, like, 13 or 14 years old. Like, one, never use the N-word. No. Because that's, like, so taboo. Um, but like I definitely used language that I would in no way use now. Like I use the the F word that's like a homosexual slur sometimes, like like the R word, you know, that's an ableist term. Like that like that language when I was again like thirteen or fourteen, I used it because I didn't really understand the larger context in which that language existed sometimes. And if we have younger listeners who think that's horrifying, that also Culture changes fast. That sure. was more of a thing. It was more of a thing, but we were also, but but, but only also, for like thirteen years. Yes, like only not for thirteen. For yes. a, like that language was bad then. Yeah. But like, and I think one of your things you're saying though is that for no age group now is that an okay thing? Yeah. You know. But yeah, but it's but like regardless, like you know, fucking thirteen year olds are going to do dumb shit. Like if a thirteen year old says that online, you have to like have perspective on how young they are, and like that's like I would understand that, and I like you know, like come to terms with like, you know, stuff that you do when you're younger because you grow out of it. It's like PewDiePie's not a kid. He doesn't, there's no excuse. There's no like that slipped out because that doesn't just slip out. Like, like language, here, let's, let's, let's get into language theory, linguistics and semiotics for a second. Language very literally and, and realistically and actually constructs and informs the way you think. Like you think through language. Like, different linguistic terms modify your ability to think about things. Like, how you think informs how you speak. And that is that is just, like, cognitive fact. And so, you, when, you, when you let something slip out, quote-unquote, the way he said it, it's like, that doesn't mean that it didn't mean anything. That actually means that that's what you were thinking in that moment. Like, that's part of, like, that has informed your actual self and you're expressing your actual self. Like, the N-word is a term that has so much loaded, historical, incredibly deep-seated racial hatred baggage associated with it, particularly in the way that he was using that word. That's like... You it's know, a white guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, talking about how it's used in, like, African-American vernacular English, that's a totally different discussion. How he was using that word was 100% how that word was used in, you know, like, the villain would use it in a Quentin Tarantino movie, right? Like, it's that kind of shit. Like Quentin Tarantino would use it in a Quentin Tarantino movie. Sure, yeah. It's it's the kind of, like, you know, the way he was using it was the way that is informed by all that hate and, and, and racial bias with it. Or else he wouldn't have used it in this, like, expression of anger towards this, like, other player in the video game. You know, he would have... If, if it wasn't associated with all that stuff, he would have never chosen to use that word in the first place. So him using that word like that just gives us access to, like, oh, yeah, no, like, you're... A racist like you are like straight up you would not use that word unless that was informed by some sort of like ideology or something that is behind that like there has to be something there and it is a specific racial term you're you're not just using that randomly if you don't just grab words out of a fucking box you know it, it's something that you can't just excuse it and laugh it away the way he used that word in that moment where he was not aware of like the platform he was on Tells you that he uses that word in his private time constantly. Like, he must. And this is where the, the intersection for me with the other conversation about sexism in the, in the film scene comes in. Because it's about this toxicity that people at the top allow to perpetuate or perpetuate themselves that creates a culture. Yeah. Because PewDiePie saying... If, okay, let's say 
PewDiePie, I don't remember his name, Felix Kjellberg or something. Yeah. Let's say Felix Kjellberg never got famous on the internet. And he's just a guy sitting in his home playing a video game, and he says the N-word like that. That's still awful. And he shouldn't do that. He's an adult. It's yeah. a terrible thing to do. There's a difference when he is PewDiePie, the most popular YouTuber. He is watched by tens of millions. Many of them are kids. Yeah. And he informs a generation of young white male gamers. Yeah. And he, by doing that, by doing the other shit he does, and, you know, this is one blip on the radar that is particularly horrible, but there's a lot of blips of him saying, of, of all the rape culture jokes and the misogyny and all this stuff that we don't take seriously enough either, because all yeah. of it should be worth the outrage. And what that does is that perpetuates this thing that should be going away, which is kids online talking like utter assholes. Yeah. Kids are always going to do dumb things. You can help mitigate it by being a good role model. Yeah. You know? Like, <laughs> you know, um, I don't, I don't, for instance, we talked about, we, we came up watching like the Rooster Teeth stuff. Yeah. I don't watch a ton of the Rooster Teeth stuff anymore, but they have a big Let's Play network and they have lots of good stuff and they don't go around saying the N-word, you know? No. They're, yeah. In fact, no. I would say they, they can be outrageous and have fun. They're pretty responsible in terms of representation and who they have on and, 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 you know, showing kids a role model of how to have fun with games without... Being an, uh, a racist asshole. You yeah. can do it. There are more Let's Players who do a good job at this than bad. Yeah. You know? That's that's just a thing. But, feel it, you know, this guy PewDiePie is at the top. And so that feeds into everything. You know, I've, I, uh, I am known to shit on the website Polygon on this podcast. Yeah. But they did have an article this week that I liked and I want to call out because I want to be nice when I can. That was, Gamers like PewDiePie are why I don't play online. By uh, Mike's Shoulders um, yeah. is his name. And He's a guest writer. Yeah, and you know, I look at an article like that, particularly that headline just caught my attention because, yes, that's a great way to phrase it, you know? That that's the kind of thing that keeps people feeling like they are not accepted online, that they, are, they don't want to have fun in these online spaces that should be inclusive and a good community. And a guy like PewDiePie going around and doing this shit uh, and being this horrible role model to you know, kids and young adults and, and perpetuating this kind of culture is awful and shines poorly on everyone else. Yeah. On absolutely everyone else. So, you know, there are many more things we could get into about the business side of this, like the adpocalypse that's happening on YouTube. And on one level, you know, that's a horrible thing for all the creators doing good work. And I feel very bad for them. I also understand the position of the advertisers because once you realize, oh shit, there's this racist well within yeah. all this and we don't want to be associated with that, that's their right. They don't want to be associated with that. Yeah. But, you know, it, uh, Felix, you know, PewDiePie doesn't just have a responsibility to himself. He has a responsibility to the community not to shine this negative light on it. Because when you start doing that, it does, it's a community issue. It's not just him. And that doesn't mean other people who do good work are responsible for it. But they also have to bear the burden. Yeah. And it sucks for everyone. And it's just that kind of thing of that if you are, like, making those kinds of jokes and using that kind of language for that, like, younger audience, you are normalizing those concepts and those, that language to them. That is then, again, that's just perpetuating the problem and extending it further and further when it's like we should be getting better at this, not worse. And it's like – and it's one of those things that it does, like, push people like us away or, or the person who wrote that article on Polygon and pushes us out of those kinds of communities that then just help those communities be, like, walled off and shelled off and allow that kind of behavior to fester. You know, that, that to where, like, you know, it takes a really big slip up on the part of PewDiePie where he just straight up says the N-word like that, like, to for anybody to notice. When he's been making those kinds of jokes and using that kind of language constantly for years, yeah. just, like, not as explicitly. And, you know, so much of that, and realizing that this is not just not solved, but in some ways getting worse, makes me so sad because, as I said, I, you know, we've been gaming since online console gaming started to be a thing. Yeah. And I've largely been scared off going online in chat because it's just not something I like to do. And that's not, you know, I'm a white straight guy. Yeah. It's not because I get, like, harassed all the time. It's because I find it annoying and toxic and gross. And I, you know, and I'm not the target, if you're the target of that, it's even worse, yeah. much worse, more than, you know, I think we can like fathom. And so I've been put off that and I'm probably never going to get back into that. Like I realized playing Destiny 2 this week, there's a guided games thing they have now that's cool. And in the, the couple of experiences I've had in Destiny where I do get in a group and do a raid or something, it's been generally a positive experience. But I, I still have this like social anxiety where I just don't like to get online and talk to random people in a video game. Yeah. And I want... To live in a world where you know kids coming up through the the the, the community now 
don't have to feel that way. And they can hopefully have more positive experiences. And I do think there are areas where people can have more positive experiences. There's lots of cool, you know, Let's Players making cool communities yeah. and games that I think uh, embrace a certain positivity like Minecraft or something when you play together. And that's great. And I do think in some ways it is better than when we were kids. But then you look at PewDiePie and I think the culture he promotes and is part of all of this that is perpetuated by him and, and, and is perpetuated, you know, within him. And, and made in like sort of couched in a larger culture yes. that's where this stuff has sort of like bubbled up and yeah. been, been much more apparent over the past yeah. couple of years than it's not hiding away in the shadows yeah. it was when we were kids. Right. And it's and it's just a reminder like, no, people still have to deal with this shit and that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. The other part of the PewDiePie thing I want to bring up um, really quickly because you're talking about the apocalypse reminded me of it is because it caused a bit of a stir that I found interesting because I kind of disagreed with a lot of the main grain of the conversation was that uh, Campo Santo which is the developer that made the game Firewatch that came out, I think, last year, maybe two years ago. Um, after all the PewDiePie stuff came out, um, they basically went on Twitter and said, we are immediately, we are DMCAing our, uh, his Firewatch Let's Play of our game, and we are like taking that down immediately because of this, because we're not just going to like sit idly by and let our content be associated with that. And the main... 100% within their right. Yeah, yeah, and I basically agree with what they did, but the main sort of, like, conversation I found in a lot of the video game community was, like, ooh, like, that's a step too far. And I found, like, a lot of, like, people talking about... What I found just like, kind of weirdly hilarious was people talking about, like, this slippery slope argument of, like, well, if we let them DMCA this video, then, like, all these other people, like... Like then, it, like then, what like grounds do we have to stand on if we're like in this okay. sort of larger or like copyright argument on YouTube? And the thing that Joe be fucking saying about that is like, you idiots, you can't make a slippery slope argument when we're already at the bottom of the hill. We're in the gutter. Like yeah. there's no, there, we're not standing on the top of this like precarious hill, being like, if one thing shifts, then then it all breaks down. Like the copyright stuff on YouTube has been broken since YouTube started. Like you could, like I could fucking take a random video game, like video down on YouTube by filing a DMCA claim that I have no right to at all. And, and YouTube would just respond to it and see to that immediately and take it down. You see that happens all the fucking time. People who like, you know, made music for a video game and like specifically allowed like license that developers like you can use this in your trailer. I am the person who made this music. Some other random company that has no right to that will to get that video taken down because the algorithm fucked up or whatever. Yeah, we and we actually have that on uh, Mario Part Three. It's not out to the public yet. It has a copyright claim, so you'll see ads, which we do not run ads. Um, and it's because a random consortium of companies claimed on the music in Mario 64. There's nothing I can do to fix that. Yeah. It's part of the video. It's part of the game. Yeah. So the developers of the game saying we don't want this full 100% like playthrough of our like three to four hour long story based video game that does not have a lot of replay value to like be up on his YouTube channel like... I think like the way, especially like the way copyright laws are right now, they 100% have the legal right and authority to do that. Like they are, there's, I don't even think there's much gray area anymore. Okay, let me rant on this for a second. Okay. Here's the thing people are saying that pisses me the fuck off is it's like, oh, but no, it's, it's, if you do that to one person, you have to do it to all of them because you're not, you know, uh, applying the law equally to all of them. You're saying is, but, 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 but. And then they're saying, you know, that the problem with that is that, oh, you're saying it's because he has different opinions than you. And even if we agree that his opinions are wrong, it's still a bad thing to do. Free speech. Blah, 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 blah. It's not an opinion to use the N-word. Right. It's not a political stance to, to degrade other races and sexes and people. Yeah. That's n I don't care what Donnie fucking Trump in the White House says. That's not a political stance. That's just racism. It's like the thing of like... Don't punch Nazis. You know, what if, what if you, how would you feel if someone punched? I'm not a Nazi. I'm not advocating for people's genocide. This, this, this isn't a slippery slope. We're down in the gutter, not just on the technocrat level you're talking right. about. We're down in the gutter morally. And the Firewatch devs were like, we want to get out of the gutter because we don't want our game we worked hard on covered in racist mud and filth. And that's the difference. And yes, whatever option they have to use to get that off they are well within their right to have an avowed fucking racist kicked off of their video. Yeah. 
that is a okay in my book. Yes, because you know what? Like... They shouldn't be accepted in society. That behavior just cannot be accepted. It's not an opinion because when you accept that behavior, you minimize and erase other people and take away their rights, and their rights matter more because they are not oppressors. Yes, exactly. I think because there are two sides to the argument that, that like I think both come down for I think for both of us like on the same thing of like there's as you were just articulating there's the moral side of it of like they are like. Yes, you're like 100% morally justified in saying like, we don't want this racist dude who's spewing racist stuff be associated with our like creative project at all. So it's like they are the moral right there. And then legally, you know, like Persona 5 came out earlier this year in the West. And when it came out, Atlas like put out this blanket statement. Like if you play this game past this point and put videos out about it on the internet, we are, we are like telling you right now, we will DMCA claim your videos. And it's like, there's not any sort of like, legal gray area there anymore like that's just the reality of let's play content and like that kind of stuff on the internet as it is right now until if there's ever laws that pass that change this you can have a different discussion then but as it is right now it is just this like you know tacit agreement that for most companies they recognize a mutual benefit of having like you know let's players make videos of their content and then and even more and more now we're having like specifically licensed and sponsored videos where there is a legal like record like specific recognition in the let's players authority in making a video because they're being licensed and sponsored by the developer like like but in other than outside of that like sponsored relationship the developer holds all the power and at any point like you know the the people who make the game have the right to take action against you if they just deem it necessary. And other than that, it has to just be this and unspoken agreement sure. that it's just okay because it's mutually beneficial. Like that's the, there's no there's no weird room where Campo Santo is somehow, I think, weighing that conversation one way or the other. They are acting within the legal authority that has already basically been established by how it's been working for years on the internet. And we're not saying that that's right or how it ideally should be, but it is the way it is. And either way, I also think I do want to live in a world where indie developer sees a racist playing their game, they can stop that. Yeah. Or, or, or playing it online for public consumption. It's different than if, you know, have the right to buy the game and play it. That's a different thing. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, that's, I think I, whatever system we have, fucked up or not, I think that's, oh, good that they have that option, you know? Yeah. Because, um, again, it's it's not like, the flip side people would say is like, well, what if it was the other side and a, and a, you know, a, a bigot dude saw like a gay couple playing their game, and then they could take it down. It's like that's different. Being gay yeah. isn't a horrible opinion. Yeah. It's yeah. a, it's a, it's just a lifestyle. It's just a thing you are. Being a racist is very different. Exactly. Be yeah. Being gay is not a choice. Being racist is very much a choice. Yeah. You know. So look, th lots of implications we could get into, but yeah. Yeah. So so now let's like step out and do like the the big level discussion to to close this out. Like, like, it's fucked up. I just, yeah. I'm sick of it. And I'm sick of, it is the thing, I'm, I'm sick of people equivocating and playing in the muck with the, you know, oh, what PewDiePie said was bad, but, and then the, the millions of ellipses after that, which right. is, it was in the heat of the moment. We all make mistakes. Or, or like, it was on a... Like, no, no, we don't all do that. Like, if you're someone who's, like, made that comment online, because I've seen, I saw hundreds of those, it's like, oh, I mean, it's just, he's just, just angry and it slipped out in the heat of the moment. Like, every that happens to everyone once in a while. It's like, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It really, you need to take a look at yourself, because seriously, it does not. Yeah. Trust me on this. Donald Trump has made it through hundreds of rally speeches without saying it. And you know he wants to. Yeah. He has better fucking impulse control than this guy. Yeah. Like, he he's like, like, Donald Trump is a, like, obviously, like, kind of like, as weird as it is to use this word, he's like a devout racist throughout, he's been for decades, you can see that in all these actions he's taken, and he, even he, he is smart enough not to just fucking blurt that word out. Yeah. Anyway, so there's that. Like, that ellipses pisses me off. The ellipses of... But the Firewatch devs, oh, they, we, need, we need to leave bad reviews on Steam. But, 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 but. No, it's, it's, you cannot minimize these things. There's no two sides to this. And I'm not saying PewDiePie needs to go to jail and lose all of his livelihood and be outcast from society and all no. that. But I am saying there should be consequences for what he does. And those consequences are not... He gets to keep doing whatever he wants while we argue in our corner about the moral relativism of reacting to racism. Right. Yeah. That's my number one thing. Yeah, and and that like, like and then you can take that to I think like 
the great like the element of that is like great like from an argument perspective is like that the Devin Faraci stuff of where yes. it came out that he was sexually harassed women and so then Tim Lee and everyone was like okay well then we're, he's leaving like like he's not associated with us anymore except for he was except for he actually was working there for like an entire year like being paid by that company it's like what the fuck message does that send? Because again, it's not, there are like two totally different conversations to have about like whether or not there should be like legal repercussions, which for some of that, like the sexual harassment behavior, yes, but that's a different thing. There's also just the perspective of like from like a personal business level of like that company 100% has the right to fire someone if they have sexually harassed people or, or there are claims against them. Like that is within their right. That is a fireable thing. Like, and it should be because yeah, it should be. you want to create the culture you want to see in the world. Yeah. And you, you when, like as a company, you are not somehow chained to have to hire someone who has sexually harassed people because they like provide them livelihood. That's not your responsibility. It's we, their responsibility not to fucking harass somebody. And if they do, they have to go find another means of making a living because they're not going to be hired by that company anymore. Or that's how it should work. Something I want to talk about the PewDiePie thing and the Devin Faraci thing is also comes Tim League's first letter he wrote about this once it came out that he had lied to everyone and Devin was still on the payroll was he talked about how he believes in giving people second chances and he believes in people rebuilding their lives and all that and the thing is you read that paragraph on paper and you're like yeah we all agree with that we agree that you know one str or we hopefully do it's a sad thing in America that we often don't actualize this through our justice system and all these things but like you know yeah if you make a horrible mistake and do something wrong I don't think that should be the end of your life but I think if you want to reintegrate into society and and you know be public again in a de you know as Devin Faraci was, and be working for this public facing company, you have to show an actual attempt to make amends. Yeah, you know that's that's a key thing. So you know here's how this actually could have gone. If let's start with PewDiePie. If PewDiePie was actually sorry. Right. The first thing he does is probably take some time off the internet. He comes back. He probably I, I think you would. Do your videos again, but you would change your tone a little bit. You would cut out the bullshit and show that you are trying to make a concentrated effort to change this. Maybe you have some conversations with, um, you know, black people in the gaming scene or women in the gaming scene or something about what you have done and what they would like to see of you to try to improve this. Do things to try to spread this conversation and not only show that what you did was wrong, but try to educate other people about that. PewDiePie is also a multimillionaire who makes tons of money off of this. He could start making donations to... The ACLU or the NAACP or something like that, you know, that, that he could, um, you know, put as the Southern Poverty Law Center or something like that to try to just show that, like, you know, I am sorry, this doesn't make up for it, but here's something material I can try to give to the world. And if he's taking those steps and showing an actual attempt to better himself, then you deserve a second chance. And that's when maybe we can agree that, okay, you maybe can keep having this livelihood. That didn't happen. Yeah. With Devin Faraci, one, it's you stop writing for that fucking site. And, you know, in your own life, you try to put this... I don't know. It's a different thing for him because he's not a giant YouTuber or something. But you also have to show amends in some way. And part of that for both him and for Tim League, who knowingly hired this guy, number one is just not being on that fucking payroll. That doesn't mean that Devin Faraci doesn't deserve to go earn a living somehow. Everyone does. Yeah. But, like... Not in that way, not at this time. Yeah, and there's like, there, are, there's a difference between having this like public facing job and then having a, pub, a more private job. You yeah. Know? Like there's a huge difference between between being a like big like writer and like public writer, like kind of basically like an editor or whatever yeah. for a magazine and then an online publication and then being someone who's like an accountant or whatever, like any other sort of like normal job. You, you don't necessarily have like those same weird like like public facing element to it that then defines like a whole part of this company to you for the world like you can't just keep on working there because that sends this message and it, like it, it sends like the message that they're sending of that like there are no consequences for these actions that it's totally fine to do this because you're there's you know like you just have to say you're sorry and that's it you don't have to like actually make some have some sort of material sacrifice because of the actions you've committed and then also it's really frustrating to then think of it of that there are hundreds thousands millions of people who are perfectly qualified to do that job yep. many of them probably like more qualified and would be better at it than devin Faraci. like like it is like 95 percent happenstance that anybody gets to the job that they're ever at it's never 100 percent through merit like 
there are lots and lots and lots and lots of people that can do that job fantastically that are not also like serial sexual harassers. Yes, and like give are, them the opportunity to do that fucking job. Yeah. So if you are Tim League wanting to make amends for this, once you fire Devin Faraci, one, you don't rehire him. I feel like that shouldn't be a step we have to say. Yeah. But I guess we have or, to say like, it. D- and also, don't rehire him in some weird secret backroom deal. Yes, like, yes, and lie to your employees. Exactly. Which is, yeah. I think, as gross as lying to the public. Because you've got a big company of people who count on you. Yeah. And a culture that is created within your company. You are responsible for them. Uh, so yeah, d- number one, don't rehire him. Two, make a real effort to show, like, we are filling Devin's job. I would say hire a woman, sure, first off, yeah. because there's way too few women in these jobs for writing in the film culture. Uh, so, so do that and maybe make a bigger show of like inclusivity and, you know like now Tim League is, is saying that they're going to have these workshops with Draft House and Fantastic Fest staff about like you know gender in the workplace and like the culture of all this stuff it's like well little little too late for that Tim League like too little yeah. too late like that would actually have been a, a great thing to I think try to do uh, to show that you were being proactive 10 months ago exactly but that's not when you did it so it's a problem um, yeah, so you know, those are steps you can take. If you're Devin Faraci, don't take the job again and show that you have so little. Re- that's not showing any kind of remorse. Yeah, and you do, you know, you know, everyone, as you say, deserves like forgiveness and a second chance. But if you go back to like any philosophical, biblical, religious writing about those things, they always also have the clause about you need to be sorry for your actions. Yeah, and, and like show some sort of consequences for the yes. actions you've taken. Yeah, there's no like, there's no just complete forgiveness. Yeah. No one gets that. Well, unless, you know, if you're talking about, like, you know, like, the Middle Ages, then you can just kind of throw the friar a couple of bucks, and it's like, okay, you're good. Yeah, You're getting to heaven now, buddy. That's not why we do it anymore. But, yeah, (laughs) at least I I don't know. The the Catholic Church still does some shady stuff. But the Pope seems, he, like, this Pope seems like he wouldn't stand for that. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, so, so, that's all, like, so self-evident. I don't even know what else to say. It's just awful. But, like, but the fact that these things have been happening, like, mean that they do, it needs to be said. Yeah, like, and here's, here's the other thing I want to say. So, I, I, I have a couple of opinions tied up here with the Draft House stuff specifically before we get into Fantastic Fest and Harry Knowles and all that grossness. Yeah. But, like, when I said earlier, like, Tim Lee lying to his employees, that's one of the things that's really sickening to me because I do love the Alamo Draft Houses here in Denver. Yeah. And I go to them a lot. I think they're some of the best theaters around. And I've heard a lot of the calls for, like, boycotting the Alamo Draft House. And... I completely understand where people are coming from on that, and I completely support if that's the action you want to take. You are well within your right to do that, and it sends the message that probably needs to be sent. At the same time, you know, if I frequent these locations and I see the people there, there are so many good people who work at these places yeah. and are trying to make a difference in the scene. And you know, the Draft House is now a nationwide chain with all these cool people getting these opportunities to work in the film scene. And to me, the goal isn't shut the Draft House down. It's Make the draft house better. Better. And, and yeah, and that, that, you know, that's not, you know, to me, a boycott of that kind of thing isn't fair to all the people who work there and are good and do good things and get these opportunities. That's punishing. You know, Tim League is rich. That You're not going to hurt him by this, you know. If he right. leaves tomorrow, yeah. he leaves on his pile of money that he made on it, you know. And, and so... You know, I, I look at like the dedication of I see in those employees, and that they are you know encouraged to their work. And I generally see you know women and men working in these uh, at the draft house and stuff. And I hope it can be a more inclusive and improving uh, business, not one that needs to be shut down and send all those people out to some other place where there may or may not be better conditions. I don't know. Yeah. So, but that's part of my thought. But that's why you know the 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 wanting it to be better for not just the people on the outside but on the inside because. The conversation is also about inclusiveness within the industry, that the filmmaking industry, the film distribution industry, which is what the Draft House is, that the film you know coverage industry, which is like Birth Movies, Death, and Fantastic Fest. And I want all of those to be better. I don't yeah. want them to go away because obviously there is more to this toxic culture than just these couple of people. And all of that needs to re- be rectified. But I guess to me when I look at that, it's I, I can't think of it as burn it to the ground and start over. Because that's never really how this kind of progress is made. Yeah. And yes, I think Tim Leake probably should step down or move into a different role at the company. If for no other reason than, you know, his staff has significant reasons to distrust him. Yeah. And that is a big, big problem. And if you believe in the mission of that company and you want it to be better, then again, a step in trying to show that you are sorry and trying to make an improvement is probably one to take yourself out of the scenario and see what you can do on the way out to improve this for all the people who have helped you, have been instrumental in building this business with you. 
Yeah. That's part of my view on it, I guess. Yeah. You know? Because... I, yeah, I this, basically agree with all that. You know, a company of this size is not a single-person auteur thing. Right. That you can knock that pin down and everything gets fixed. And if you knock the whole thing down... I don't know. I, I also think, you know, that there are positive things that can come out of all of this. Um, or the, not, not all of this, the, the sexism stuff. I just mean that the business existing and being hopefully a positive place that it tries to be inclusive for people to come and see movies. Like, you know, the Draft House over the summer, we all thought it was pretty cool with the women-only Wonder Woman screenings. Sure, yeah. And stuff like that. I want there to be a film distribution space that is exciting and inventive and shows cool things and invites different kinds of people you know, the, the draft house that we go to, you know, here, the programmers there are so good at, you know, I think programming stuff for all kinds of people and audiences. And I want that to be better. And there are these things clearly holding it back and those need to be improved. Um, <clears throat> to me, like a boycott and shutting down the whole thing um, is not the healthiest way to approach that. Yeah, because it is, it's definitely, a, I mean, it's obviously a hugely complex issue of like, I mean, it's just that kind of like question of, like what what as the consumer in the equation like what sort of power do you have to influence this stuff and i agree that like like the because like the idea of the boycott feels like it just doesn't to me most of the time that we have like boycotts in the 21st century they they don't have any real power like and i feel like that's like actually not how late capitalism operates anymore is i don't think the boycott is effective i don't it's not the 18th century it's not the 19th century like that's not how the economics of this stuff works. Like, and I should say right now, it's a different thing if you feel yeah. personally uncomfortable yeah, yeah. frequenting that business. That's I mean, a yeah, if you don't want to go, don't go. Like, yeah, obviously, yeah, that's... like, yeah. Like, but there's a there's a difference between, like, trying to sort of make an organized boycott and personally deciding, like, you are not comfortable engaging with this anymore. That's more than 100% valid to say, I don't feel comfortable yeah, there. absolutely. You have no obligation to go engage no. with any of this stuff at all. But, like, yeah, the idea of, like, the organized boycott, I agree that I just think, like, the damage that is dealt would not be to the people that you want to do damage to and, like, to have consequences for. Because like, there is something in that whole space of that we've talked about a lot about on, the, about on this podcast of, like, the theatrical space for cinema right now is generally really in the shitter. And uh -huh. Alamo Drafthouse is obviously this chain that really cares. It's one of like the kind of like the most harsh thing about finding out about a lot of this stuff is like that's so counter to the, like the image you have built for this company and like the feels like the community of like cinema lovers that have come around the Alamo Drafthouse. Like I've only been there a couple of times, but like when we both saw Shin Godzilla there um, last year, like that was an awesome experience and having that like ability to go see this like relatively small foreign movie here and like feel like people who put it together and like put the pre-reel together and everything in this experience care about this experience. That's really valuable. And, and uh -huh. I think if like Draft House goes away, I don't know who fills that void, right? So yeah, I, I, it is... It's a, it's a complicated and, question. It's a complicated question. And, and the other thing that comes into this is some of the online reaction I've seen that I also think strikes the wrong tone on the other side of this, which is people who really love the Draft House and the Austin film scene I've seen, but mostly men, having trouble articulating a good response to this because they just, they're so into this. They're like, well, okay, Tim and Devin made mistakes, but I kind of forgive it all automatically because I love this. That's not the right thing either. No. No. And, you know, I saw, um, you know, I, I'm not going to name names here, but like, you know, you know one, one person I saw who I respect said something like, you know, uh, I think Tim did the wrong thing, but I also think Tim League is a good guy, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, it's like, well, that's not the issue at play. Tim might be totally nice in your interactions with him. He might be a good person overall. I don't know. We're talking about this specific action and this specific action was categorically wrong. Yeah. You know, and that specific action needs to be reckoned with. You know, we're not talking about burning the whole person at the stake, you know. So yeah. that's that's part of it to me. Or people like, you know, let, let's get into the Fantastic Fest thing. Actually, I think okay. it's that one's easier for me than the Draft House one. Fantastic Fest might need to go away because <laughs> yeah. that's a more toxic thing. When it's, it's much more, if you actually look at it, that's much more personally dictated by Tim League. It's much more uh, just a, a based, you know, an Austin-based film thing and can be it can be a hub for the best parts of the Austin film community, which is a wonderful community in a lot of ways. It can also, and I've heard this before, these allegations are not new necessarily, be a hub for the worst of that film community, which is very much a, you know, a bro culture that is right. exclusionary in a lot of ways. And this led this week to the accusations against Harry Knowles. And I just want to say, I have read Ain't Cool News for a long time. I haven't read it in a while because a lot of my favorite writers had left. But I'd read it off and on for a while. Not specifically for Harry Knowles. I would read his stuff sometimes. I think they've 
had some interesting people there in the past, but it's always been a very up and down thing. And I want to say, if you've ever read Harry Knowles before, this was the least surprising thing I have ever seen. He's a creep. I don't, I think he has some interesting qualities too. I'm not saying he's completely horrible as a person, but he's a creep. And the fact that in his writing, the way he writes about women is really creepy. And people who write about women that way, they're not all sexual harassers, but it sure increases the likelihood. Yeah. You know, if you kind of like, okay, people were passing around on Twitter the thing he wrote about, I want to say True Blood at some point. Um, it's a famous snafu. This I don't know if he ever viewed it as a snafu, where he was talking about uh, a female vampire who was a virgin. And so every time she got fucked, her hymen would break and then come back and all this stuff. Right. Yeah. It is the creepiest fucking piece of writing. F- frankly, like, don't seek it out if, if you're at all easily triggered by these things because it's really, really gross. You can't read that and then disbelieve any of these accusations uh-huh. against Harry And number one, you shouldn't disbelieve those accusations anyway because rules yeah. one, two, and three is believe women. And then we yeah, get to rule... Like, yeah. yeah. And then maybe get to rule four, which is that if the, if the man in question has written a lot of creepy things about women in the past... Maybe believe women even more, you know? And so that's part of it. Um, You know, Harry Knowles, Devin Faraci, Tim Lee, these are all really big figures in Fantastic Fest. And late breaking today, Fantastic Fest always has one or two secret screenings where, like, people come in and they buy the ticket for a secret. And it's a true secret. Like, don't know what we're going to see. Sometimes it's a big movie. Sometimes it's an old thing. Here they found a porno made by Ed Wood that was basically very, very rapey. And that's what they showed. And then they had a QA and a afterwards... This is all today when we're recording this. They had a Q&A afterwards where a woman stood up and asked about what the, you know, the Austin film scene, Fantastic Fest, the Draft House was going to do in the future to address all these horrible things happening with sexism. And they basically said, um, you should talk to us in private later. And completely shot down the question. Jeez. I mean, that's the point where it's like, okay, here's the clearest example of this being a cultural issue with this, this scene, not just these couple of guys. Is and that nobody in that process ever thought... Maybe this isn't the movie to show. And yeah. maybe if we show this movie, we should have a lot of ideas about how to answer these kinds of questions. Yeah, like, it's just that, that to me, I mean, that's almost a flippant fuck you. Like, whether uh-huh. you had it planned in advance or not, that feels like the kind of thing that you looked at all this and said, oh, I know how to fuck with these libtards or something. You know, right. it just feels horrible kind of thing you would do. So yeah, Fantastic Fest, I feel much more like, yeah, fuck them. That's really, really bad. And maybe that needs to be purged a little more. But I don't know. It's, it's you know, and, and a couple of film distributors pulled their movies. There's a movie coming out by Martin McDonough called uh, Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri uh, with Francis McDormand. It's going to be a big Oscar movie. Sounds like it's really good. It's been touring the festivals. Once they heard about all the rape stuff with Harry Knowles and Tim League, they completely pulled their movie from Fantastic Fest because their movie is about sexual assault. Okay, and yeah. I think good on them to make that statement and yeah. not show their movie there. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, there is so much. And again, it's like, and I've seen online people wanting to wave this away because they've had a good time at Fantastic Fest. And it's like... It's like you can you can have a good time at Fantastic... Or you can have had especially a good time at Fantastic Fest. And then also say, oh, all this shit is bullshit. Yeah. This is all bad. If you... you know, those things can be true at the same time. I guess my basic point is if you go to the Draft House or you've gone to Fantastic Fest and you have felt included there and you have felt like it was tailored to you and your needs and those things, then your reaction should be... Man, it is really sad and fucked up that other people have not had that experience. Yeah. Because it is specifically doing things that are exclusionary, harmful, harassing to people. And we should all work together to make sure that we can all have that experience that I had and I enjoyed. You know? And that, to me, is the core of it. Yeah. It's just empathy. Right? Yeah. And again, I completely understand uh, if if you feel like you can never set foot in a draft house again because of these things, completely within your right and completely understandable. I'm very sad that it has to come to that. No yeah. one should have to feel out of place at these spaces. Um, and it is incumbent on the people at the top to take the steps necessary to make people feel included again. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately we have this culture where people don't have to be held responsible for their actions. And, you know, PewDiePie making one apology video is not being held responsible for his actions. Devin Fracci quitting a second time. Is, no, he's still not being held responsible for his actions. Yeah. Tim League writing an apology post on Facebook, not being held responsible for his actions. And fucking Harry Knowles, who has just completely denied all the accusations and is being combative. <laughs> In, like, the most, like, playbook way possible of, like, oh, no, we were friends and we had a relationship and I deny all this. It's like, 
Well, yep. This yeah, is. I have. How many times have I fucking seen this statement? I mean, now we have photographic evidence of like text conversations online yeah. of him harassing women. Um, I mean, just like you know, rule of thumb to all the guys out there: if you're talking to a woman online and you're not in like an explicit sexual relationship, just don't use the word dick. <laughs> just don't yeah. do it. Yeah. Just don't describe sexual acts. Just like you know, I don't know. Talk about the weather, movies. Talk. Talk. Here's the, talk to people like they're people. Yeah. Like my, my that's a great. I use. That's a great thing. Yeah. That's a simple way to say it. The world's really fucked up. Yeah. And yeah. you know we're all part of it, and we're all responsible, and we all need to do better. Yeah. And part of that is just talking through this shit. Yeah. And obviously, like we are, like in our own small part parts of these like cultures and communities of video yeah. games and in movies. And it's, Shit. it's something that we have to, even if it's like, even if it's just like on an individual basis, you have to do your best to like make sure that this, these communities are inclusive and healthy for yeah. all kinds of people. Check your privilege. You know, I've, I've, I've loved, I've talked about going to the draft house many times on this. This is a wake up call for me. If, if I, you know, I don't necessarily think I want to boycott the company or, or that sort of thing, but I still, you know, need, it is my responsibility. I think knowing these things to be more on the lookout for anything I see in that company or that culture that I feel is wrong or plays into this, right? Yeah. And that becomes your responsibility once you're made aware of it. Doesn't, or it doesn't like, mean you can change it all yourself, but you know, if something's fucked up, you can say it, you can talk about it. If you hear someone else, you can try to amplify that voice, believe that voice. There are little things we can all do. Yeah. Or like for the video game side of thing, it's something that's like be nice and pleasant online. Sure. Like like even if that's something as far as like don't teabag people in in Halo or whatever. You know, it's just like whatever. Like if you're using team chat, be nice and friendly. Even if other people are being mean, just be nice and friendly. Like that goes a long way. Like just be nice, and that that does a lot. Yeah. So Sean, we had a hard conversation. Yes. We don't usually get this serious on the podcast. Yeah, I think it was a hard transition from Agent Cody Banks to that. But <laughs> well, okay, yes. Um, you know. Uh, let's transition back. Our reward is let's do a fun, silly video game topic. I like some fun, silly video games. About things that have never hurt anyone, just like, you know, Mario 64 or something. You okay. Because that's one of the games we're going to talk about here. Okay. I mean, if we're talking about Mario Party 1, Mario Party 1 has hurt people in that one video game where you have to spin the dip. Yeah. The, the, the it literally, so, yeah, they were sued yeah, over that. Yeah. So this week, at the end of this week, the Super NES Classic is coming out. Hopefully, I will have obtained one to review on the podcast. This I time still think week. you're just going to like. There's going to be a box at your your doorstep, and you're going to open it. And it's just empty. There's just like one card that's just a middle finger. <laughs> yes, it's it's Shigeru Miyamoto cheerfully giving you the, yeah, the they, bird. but it's like it's made out of like the packing peanuts. It's yes, just outlined <laughs> at the bottom of the box. It's like that's really impressive. I didn't know Walmart would yeah. go to those lengths. I don't yeah. know how they stayed there. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, no. Uh, so hopefully we're all going to get to play the SNES Classic. The news component of this is that all indications are that Nintendo has been good to their word in gearing up production for the Super yeah, NES Classic they're relative... putting the NES Classic back out again next yeah. year. They're very adamant about, like, we're making more of these things. Yeah, we've started to see, like, unit numbers. Stores are going to start to have in stock, and they are indeed much higher than before. Now, does that mean it's going to be easy to get one of these day one? No. <clears throat> Probably not. But it sounds like it's going to be easier in the long run than the NES Classic was, and that's yeah. good. And why I wanted to mention that um, is just to pat Nintendo on the back a little bit. Sure, yeah. Proof, you know, in the wings. We, it's, a, it's a preliminary pat on the back. Yeah. Because if Walmart cancels my order again, I'm going to shiv somebody. <laughs> but <clears throat> yeah. um, anyway, I'm going to make a shiv out of an existing SNES Classic controller. Exactly. Just to, like, really prove the point. Drive the point home. Yes, no. Uh, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, so, so it seems like the the classic edition line by Nintendo is probably here to stay, right? I would say we, so. We know. I mean, that, they've been reselling us their old video games since like the Game Boy Advance, and it seems or like since the Super Nintendo. And they've it seems like they've realized this is a popular and easy way to do it, right? Yeah. Now, um, they have patented the image for an N sixty four classic, a la the NES and Super NES, yeah. which would make sense. The N sixty four is the follow up uh, home console to the NES yeah. and Super NES. No, no classic <laughs> Virtual Boy, unfortunately, it seems. I don't think we're gonna get that. But um, we're anyway. So I, mean, I wanted to do put all of the games on it. Would have been fantastic. Yes. In anticipation of the N sixty four class or the Super NES classic, I want to speculate a bit, little bit about what the N sixty four classic would be. We're gonna joke around about it. We're gonna have okay. a little fun. And I looked online last night and decided to try to make a list of what would the twenty one. I'm doing twenty one because that's what the the Super NES classic has. Right. 
and I didn't want to try to get it out to 30. Um, the 21 games that would be on the N64 Classic, I, I thought about going in a jokey direction with this, but I decided it actually is enough fun on its own. Let's try to do the serious version yeah. and try to consider the implications of could they get the rare games and things like yeah. that. So Before we get into this, I just want to emphasize I was not involved in no, the creation of this list. I have no idea what's on this list. I yeah. have some ideas probably about some of the major games that would be on this. But, like, if this is a terrible list, it's not my fault. Yeah. I just want to, you know, make that very clear. And I very much tried to model this after the lists we got for the NES and the Super NES. And I think part okay. of my goal was, you and I have joked before about the N64 has a pretty thin library of games. Yes, it does. Like, could you put together an N64 classic that would sound like a good package with a similar number of games? Okay. And surprisingly, I think you could... If for no other reason than the list I put together winds up being, I think, a pretty fascinating snapshot of a very important and transitional moment in game history. Okay. But we're going to do this alphabetical order, okay? Okay, yeah, because obviously they're not, like, ranked in quality or anything. No, no, no. Alphabetical order. Um, number one is Banjo-Kazooie. Okay, yeah. Banjo -Kazooie. Now, sense. I have two rare games on this list, and I'll just spoil another one is Goldeneye. We'll get there. I mean, but... Goldeneye would never be on there for licensing issues. No, but... no. But I'm trying to say, like, okay, you really... If you're going to do a legitimate version of the N64 Classic, it would be very hard to do that without some representation by Rare, right? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, they have not ever been able to re-release those Rare games on Nintendo consoles. They've gone to other places. Yeah. They're on but Xbox now. if you look at NES and Super NES Classics, they've done enough of bringing back games that they have not traditionally re-released, sometimes with publishers they don't work at with as much anymore, that I think it could happen. I do think Banjo-Kazooie is the one most likely that they could get. And who knows... Important moment, maybe Heaven and Earth can be moved and something can happen yeah. with GoldenEye, which has never been re-released in any form. Yeah. Is Donkey Kong Country or any of the Donkey Kong Country games on the SNES? Yeah, SNES Donkey Kong Country okay. 1 is. Yeah, yeah, so that that was a rare but, game. So, But they've always had that one because yeah. it's their character, so well, then, it's a little easier. Well, then but... why wouldn't it be Donkey Kong 64 on the N64? Uh, no, I have that on there. Okay, that's also a rare game. That is a rare game? Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, they've re-released Donkey Kong 64 on the Wii U, so okay, that one's well, fine. Okay, there you yeah. go. Yeah. All right, so, so if they couldn't get Banjo and the Kazooie, they could get yeah. Donkey Kong the 64. And I'm thinking we only get Banjo-Kazooie, not Banjo-Tooie, because that would be a step too far. I'm sure it's a great game. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. So number two is Castlevania Legacy of Darkness, because they've had Castlevania games on both the NES and the Super NES. Yeah. Now, uh -huh. sadly, the Castlevania games on N64 are flaming hot shit. Uh-huh. But... I think it would still be interesting from a historical perspective to have them. Sure. This is the special edition of Castlevania 64, so I think it's the version they would include. And, you know, I think Capcom's up for it. They're not making games anymore, so fuck it. <laughs> it's They'll chill it out. Yeah. They're not quite into the Konami space of being really gross about it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they're just licensing these days. Uh, three and four are two Donkey Kong games. We have Diddy Kong Racing and right, Donkey yeah. Kong 64. Donkey Kong 64 is obvious. That would have to be on there. Yeah. Diddy Kong Racing is... I think the kind of like nice little obscurity that people still have fond memories of that they like to pepper on these collections. Yeah. So I think you'd get it. I think you'd get that. Yes. Number five, also a racing game, F Zero X. Because okay, they have, right. Yes. Yeah. There was yeah. an F Zero game on the sixty four. They had F. They have F Zero One on the Super NES. I I think they would bring it back. They have not re released this one on Virtual Console for the Wii U at least, but I think they'd do it. Yeah. So we have that. I can see that. Number seven is Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards. Yeah. Just obvious. That's, that's a good game. Good game. You, if you put the lightning and cutter powers together, you, did, you get the Darth Maul lights. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. Next we have, um, we get into the part of the alphabet that is M, so we have some Marios. Okay. Um, and it's not even all the Mario games. Mario Kart 64. Yeah, Just obviously. obvious. Yeah. Mario Party 2. Now, I think they would not include all of the three Mario Party games. No, I mean, that would be only if they're one, very desperate to fill yeah. out that lineup. Yeah, one, they're never re-releasing Mario Party 1. They never have, they never will. They got sued up the ass for yeah. it. Yeah. Mario Party 3, like, I think it would be between 2 and 3, but 2 is the better one, and I think fans like it more. It's the one they have on the Wii U Virtual Console, so I think we'd get Mario Party 2. You don't want those battle mini games or whatever, of, of, of their dual mini games yeah. or whatever Mario Party 3 has? I like Mario Party 3, but it, yeah. Mario Party's too bad. Okay, and then 10... This is when Mario sports games started getting big. And I think you have to have one sure, of them yeah. representative here. And so I picked Mario Tennis. Okay. Yeah. Now, this was the first Mario Tennis game, unless you count the Virtual Boy. So this is the first Mario Tennis game. Okay. It's also the first appearance of Waluigi ever. It's That's the first okay, appearance yeah. of Daisy in her modern 3D form, because Daisy had only been the name of a character who you really don't see in Mario Land for the Game Boy. Right. And this is the return of Birdo, first 3D Birdo. I mean... Look at that lineup. That's He's historic. Have, that's historic. You've got to have Mario Tennis on there. Of no, course. I mean, everyone knows from having played Super Mario yeah. Brothers 2 how much Birdo loves tennis. Yes. Now, number 11. Here's another tough one because 
I, I mentioned earlier a Castlevania game. I feel like you kind of have to follow Castlevania into 3D because you did it on the NES and SNES. Sure. They also on the NES and SNES had Mega Man. And Capcom is always happy to put Mega Man out. So I think you have to have Mega Man 64. It's also a flaming hot piece of garbage. Yeah, this, never, it would never. I don't. I feel you like You can Cap, buy it I on think, the. I think Capcom forgot that they made Mega Man 64. You can get it on the PS3 and PS Vita. It's you on can. PS1 Classics. It's called, I forget what it's called there, but Mega Man 64 is the same game as yeah. Mega Man on PlayStation. So you can get it. Okay, I rented that game once. I don't yeah. remember much about it. It's not very good. Uh, number 12, Paper Mario. Yeah, absolutely. We, we yes. have a, yeah. we have a lineup of stone cold classics. You mean coming number up, Sean. one, Paper Mario? Yeah, but we're gonna have Paper Mario on there. Obviously, we're gonna have Pokemon Snap. Yes, gonna yeah. have Pokemon Snap. You're gonna have Pokemon Stadium Two because Pokemon Stadium Two Thousand. Okay, as it's... it was properly titled, <laughs> Pokemon Stadium Two. Because uh, you're probably not gonna include both Pokemon Stadiums, no. and the second one is better. Yeah, I mean, this um, has got more Pokemon. Here's one that at first I thought would be unlikely, but then I remembered it's been re-released on both DS and 3DS, and that's Rayman Two: The Great Escape. Okay, right. that would be a really. I think of the Rayman games as being PlayStation games, but it was on the N64 as well. Yeah, and this was a well, and it was on the N64 first. This one was okay. made for N64 first, and it's uh, it was released. For instance, it was a launch game on the 3DS as Rayman 3D. So they continue to have a good relationship. That the new Rayman one is also on Switch. So like, I think that would happen. I love that you pronounce it Rayman, not Rayman. What did I? Was the I way I say that Rayman? people people say oh, it. Oh, Rayman. Rayman. Sorry. <laughs> like Rayman. Rayman. Everybody loves Rayman, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> He's great. I can't wait for the Everybody Loves Raymond movie where he's voiced by Ray Romano. Sure. That's Rayman. Raymond. I don't know. Did, did that joke went somewhere? All right. Uh, we've got... Okay, the rest of this list is Stone Cold Classics. Okay. I'm just going to list them. Star Fox 64. Yeah, that's a good game. Super Mario 64. That's a very good game. Super Smash it's very, Brothers. It's harder than you remember the Super Mario 64, I think. Super Smash Brothers. Very good, yeah. Great game. Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Yep. Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Yep. And Yoshi's Story. Sure, that's an okay game. Yeah. You'd have to have it, right? Yeah. And then I thought, okay, so that's 21. I think that's actually a surprisingly good lineup. That's a, of- that's a decent lineup. You've got that Castlevania game. I can't vouch for the quality of that F-Zero game. Donkey Kong 64 is not that good. I kind of like Yoshi it. But- stories. Okay, but I think you have to have them. Like as the as sure, the, if you're trying to do the, like his, and this is what I mean. Have. I'm not saying that there are a lot of N64 games that are better than those. I'll I'm just saying they're not that good. I'll read you some of the ones I left off in a minute, um, okay. and we'll just talk about those because some of them were so pie in the sky that they were never going to happen. But like, I do think that's an interesting list because you have a ton of Stone Cold classics on a couple, a, a good amount of Stone Cold classics. Yeah, you got Paper Mario, Pokemon Snap, Super Mario 64, and Ocarina of Time. Yeah, and you have some other and Smash really, Brothers. I'd Smash Brothers. Smash Brothers. You have some really, really good ones on that list. Even second tier, like Majora's Mask, Star Fox 64, um, Kirby 64. Not like the best games ever, but really worth having. Yeah. And then you've got some other ones, and I think this would give a good idea of what the N64 was, some of the highs and the lows. I think that would be a good, worthwhile list of games. Sure. Now, I did think... Now, what if they did a bonus game the way they did Star Fox 2 on the Super NES? What would that be? And Thomas and I, my brother, were actually brainstorming on this because there's not as obvious a choice. But we came up with it. The original N64 version of Animal Crossing from Japan, which was an N64 game before it was on GameCube. They do have the translation because it's basically just a GameCube game. Throw that on there. Bonus game. Sure. I mean, only for the Western market is it a bonus game, but yes. Sure. Well, for the Japanese, it's just, they get it. 22 games. Okay, sure. That's not bonus. <laughs> fuck, fuck you, you don't get no bonus game. You just get normal ass Animal Crossing. Uh, is, okay. Yeah. In, uh, uh, these are, some of these are alphabetized, but okay, in, in rough order, here are the ones I left off. Okay. And was considering for various reasons. Banjo-Tooie, because they're not going to get both. That's true. Uh, Do- I mean, they probably wouldn't even get one. <laughs> probably but, not, yeah. but we'll see. Doom 64 would be <laughs> cool to have... I think they could get it. I don't sure. think they would put it on there. No, yeah. Even I, if Doom is going to be on the Switch, I don't think they're doing that. It'd be cool to have. I mean, it's, I think Doom 64 is the version that has like different music and it's all mm-hmm. weird. Well, it's, it's technically a different... It's got a lot of different yeah. levels and stuff. It's bizarre. Uh, okay, then two Star Wars games, Rogue Squadron and Shadows of the Empire. Sure, yeah. They'd be great to have. They, they they're not happening. Because yeah. you know? like, I would love to have the Super Star Wars games on the SNES Classic, but they just, they're not getting those. Yeah. So, uh, let, let's see. Spider-Man 64, which is the N64 version of the PlayStation game. Yeah. Great game. Great never, game. That I wouldn't that happen. PC. Yeah, that wouldn't happen, but it's really worth oh, playing yeah. if you've never seen it. Um, or at least watching some clips. Stanley narrates. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, the original Pokemon Stadium, because they're only going to do one. Pilot Wings 64. I think that might show up if they actually did it. Yeah, th- I think that would absolutely be on there if they actually did okay. it. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because that was like, it was like that in Super Mario 64 were the launch games for the N64. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, Mario Party 3 and Mario Party 1, I explained my reasoning yeah. there. Mario Golf, I just, you know, I think tennis would be the more enticing of those. Dr. Mario 64, didn't know that was a game. <laughs> Neither did I. Yeah. Um, Maybe I, that's the bonus game. It's bonus because everybody forgot it. Yeah. Uh, one that I also think very much could make it as a dark horse, uh, especially if you took the rare games off, is Harvest Moon 64. Sure, yeah. Um, but but they that. didn't have Harvest Moon on the SNES Classic, which leads me to believe it's not a priority for them. And they could get it. The Harvest Moon yeah. games are on... They still publish them, so I think they could get it. Um, and then the one that I really wanted to include and come up with some pie in the sky thing where they would include the peripheral necessary in the box for this thing is Hey You Pikachu. Yes. Because I love the idea of an N64 classic where they give you like two controllers and the microphone for Hey You Pikachu. Yes. Would that's just... Yeah, that's all 100%. That's what it should be. Yes. That's, what, that's like... That should just be the only game. That's what like the N64 classic. It's just that the thing is just like bolted into the controller and you just get Hey You Pikachu. Yep. So feel free... Uh, to argue with me on this, swap games in and out, I would love to hear your own lists and what suggestions you have. I'd also like to remind us all, here's how thin the N64 list is. How, how I compiled this is I found an alphabetical list on Wikipedia of every game ever published for the N64, uh -huh. and I was able to go through it game by game and make this list. Would be an impossible task for most consoles. Yeah, that's like that would be like 800 games or something like that on the NES. Yeah, no, on the N64 I was able to do that in about 20 minutes. So... I do think I found all the good ones. Okay. I've got like a couple of, of things to consider here um, from my own history with the N64. Gauntlet Legends was a pretty good game. I'd maybe throw their, that in there. It's a Gauntlet game on the N64. Okay. It's a good multiplayer game. So you could get that on there. Um, there's You don't have any fighting games on there, which I understand because there were, were there no any? good fighting games on the N64. None. I have two candidates, though. One of them, no. One of them would probably actually be on there. The no one is Clay Fighter 63 and a third. Terrible fucking game. I think it was a Blockbuster exclusive. Are you going to say Ready to Rumble Boxing? No. I, okay. But sure, we'll throw that Ready to Rumble Boxing. That was my parents when they got me my N64 for Christmas. It had Smash Bros and Ready to Rumble Boxing. My so. condolences. Um, the, but the other one... I'll remind you all that Sonic 06 is the first game I ever played in HD. Move on. Because it's, yeah, it's what we know, had. You've, you've lived a sad life, Jonathan. We all know that. Um, but the, the actual fighting game, because I'm like 95% sure that this was also released on the N64, would be Killer Instinct. Okay. I think that would be, I think they could get Killer Instinct. I don't think they'd get Banjo Kazooie, but I think they could maybe swing Killer Instinct. Okay. That would be the one fighting game I could kind of envision being on there. So here's the thing I think from our discussion and my list and uh, suggestions you could make and things we could swap in and out, I think you could get the games on there to make this worthwhile. Sure. I think you could have yeah, the because also you don't necessarily need 20 games. Like, I could see them cutting that list down because they, they are bigger games and, yeah. in at least, like, data size than the, the Super yeah. Nintendo game would be on. I'd want at least 20 because I think in... I could get a list of 20 out of all of these, the ones I included and didn't, that I think you would want those 20, 21 games. Sure. The thing for me that is the huge question mark that I'm sure Nintendo engineers are scratching their heads about is what do you do about the controllers? How do you replicate them easily? Uh -huh. Do you want to replicate them exactly? Because you could make a really cute little N64. That's not a problem, right? Oh, absolutely. But then it's, what do you do with the replica controllers? Because the N64 controllers are horrible. Yeah. You also ideally would want four of them because so many of these are four-player, multiplayer experiences. Yeah, like Mario Party would be useless if it only had one or two controllers. And, and the SNES Classic does have two, so I think it would have at least two, and that'd be fine. But, like, you'd have to be able to have people buy more. What do you do? Like... My my joke was that they include one N64 controller and one Xbox 360 controller. <laughs> just like they get some extras from Microsoft. Yeah, there's, you know, they just hand them out. Yeah, just like they get some extra Steam controllers because those aren't selling. Yeah. Like, I don't know what you do. It's like, whatever happened to the Ouya? They had controllers, didn't they? Let's get those. It's just like, that is to me the biggest... Because if you wanted this, I think this might cost a little more than... Let's say, so the NES Classic was 60 I think. The any Super NES Classic is eighty. I think this might go up to ninety nine, but then the question really becomes: How can you manufacture those controllers easily and well enough to really like ship them with this? Do people even want them like that? That to me is the biggest question mark hanging over the N sixty four Classic. Yeah, I, I, it is because I think the only answer to that is you just 
fucking make the same controller. Obviously, like, the materials would be updated and stuff. So, like, presumably, you know, that fucking analog stick would not be made out of, like, compressed chalk or whatever the fuck that weird dust was that probably we are all going to get cancer from it at some point. That's my guess. That can't have been good for us. That shit was bad. Um, Like, like if you haven't looked at an N64 controller lately, but you still have some, go look at those and, like, look at, like, the pit that the control stick is in because it's disturbing how much powder is just in there, like, baked into the controller. Um, It's pretty fucked up. Yeah, but, yeah, because it's, like... You would part of you wants like the redesigned version of the controller where you can crazy idea access every single button on the controller from the same position, the way every other controller ever has been made, and that is the one that we're like, let's make it so the only two thirds of the controller are ever accessible to the player at any given moment. Let's build a controller that way. Ideally, you would want one that you know was made like a normal human controller, but. The whole point of this thing is it's like a nostalgia play. Yeah. And what's the point of a nostalgia play if it's only the good stuff? We need like the weird quirks as well. It is the weird thing. Like the the thing is if you do the NES or Super NES Classic and the nostalgia play, it's great to play those games with those controllers. Yeah, those controllers are still fine. Yeah, they're in fact the SNES controller, a lot of people still love that form factor. I'm one of those people. Nobody loves the form factor of the N64 controller. Yeah. So one, I think one option would be to do a redesign of something that is easier for everybody. But as you say, then that takes away the nostalgia factor. And nostalgia can be good and bad. Yeah. Anyway, this has been a silly, dumb discussion yeah. just for fun. And obviously the bonus game should be Superman 64. Like, that's where, that's <laughs> what, like, we should not bury our history, Jonathan. It has to live with us so we don't do it again. I rented that game. Okay, Sean. Got a tough question for you. Uh Uh-huh. So would you rather... Okay. Would you rather watch the three-hour R-rated extended cut of Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice in its entirety... Okay, yeah. ...or play Superman 64 to the end credits? Oh, watch Batman v Superman. Okay. Absolutely. Have you ever played any of Superman 64? No, I just know how much you hate that movie. It is... You should... You should play some Superman 64. That should be... We should do a video. I'm not playing it. (laughs) I am not playing it. But I will sit and watch you play that game so you can know. So you can fucking know. Because you play one second of that game and you know that's the worst fucking video game ever made. Like Easy. Easy that I've played. God, I can't even imagine. Because it would be longer, way longer than three hours. Because it's not like that game has that much content but just trying to get through the first level is a massive pain in the butt i think i now know if i'm architecting your hell Uh like your purgatory the only game you can play is superman 64 (sighs) and while you do it jesse eisenberg's lex Luthor, his dialogue runs on a loop in your ears yeah because that's the one the one golden shining only bright spot of superman 64 is it is based on the animated series so it's those art designs it's got the great like flying sound effect from that cartoon and it's I believe it's those voice actors or it's like people trying to like do an approximation of Clancy Brown as as Lex Luthor so if you took that performance of Lex Luthor out and then put uh, Jesse Eisenberg in yes that would be I would yank the analog stick out of the the N64 controller and slit my throat with the jagged edge (laughs) because you know it's a jagged edge yes it absolutely is did you hear uh, getting off topic that it's the rumor that uh, Jesse Eisenberg has been cut completely from Justice League. Yeah, I mean, it would have been nice if, like, the rumor had been, like, he's being cut from the director's cut. He was cut from the extended edition of Batman v Superman. It's extended because he's not in it anymore. That's better. Yes. No. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like Joss Whedon is just remaking the movie. Yeah, that seems to be where they're at with that one. Um Joss Whedon also was an ass to his wife for like 20 years. So yeah, that was another big one. There are no heroes. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Um... Quick Patreon shout-outs. Right, This yeah. is probably our last podcast of September because September's a short month. Yes. Uh, and we'll be recording on October 1st, the next one. So, uh, quick Patreon shout-outs. It's the same two Patreons as last time who have the $15 level. That's Mr. Barry Donnelly. Yep. Thank you very much. And Mr. Much. Kenneth Serenyi. I think that's how I pronounce his name. Yeah. We talked about them last month. Kenneth, once upon a time, donated to get us our first microphone. Love him for that. Love some of the comments he's had. He's had some fun things he's posted over on our Patreon if you are if you look at the community chat and stuff. And Barry, uh, I think it was you who posted when I put up the Mario 64 videos two weeks ago. Uh, he said something about this timestamp, um, that was glorious or something. And I looked at the timestamp because I was like, what was he talking about? And it's the moment where I fell off the map right after getting the first star and I didn't actually get the first star on the snow level. Uh-huh. And I was just like, thanks, Barry. 
I had to relive that. Yeah, you've got a lot of good stuff waiting ahead for you if you like that one, Barry. Yep. All right, so thank you guys for being our patrons. If you would like to join our Patreon, they get a shout-out because they're at the $15 level. I need to get better about posting a more consistent Q&A thing. It was off a little bit in September because our dates moved. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, but we'll get that worked out in October. And thank you guys for pledging. And we will be back uh, in a second. We're going to take a break. Won't be a break for you guys to talk about Metroid Samus Returns and Destiny 2 and an October game preview. All right. So, Sean, this has been a very emotionally up and down couple hours of podcasting. Yeah, I mean, we talked about Superman 64. We talked about Agent Cody Banks. We talked about sexism and racism in, in gaming and uh, movie communities. And it's been a whole podgepodge of topics. Um, but now I get to talk about an unreserved high for me, which is Metroid Samus Returns. All right. On the 3DS, which is one of the best games of the year. Might be the best game on the 3DS. It's that, or one of the Fire Emblems, or Zelda Link Between Worlds, and they'll have to fight it out, in my mind. But it's an amazing, amazing game. And I know this because I have now beat the game twice in the span of one week, or one and a half weeks. Right. And I never do that. But I want to describe some of the process for this, because um, when I talked about Metroid Samus Returns last week, I was on the cusp of getting to like the last area, but I wasn't there yet. And the last part of the game didn't like dramatically change my opinion, but it did solidify all the stuff I think this game does spectacularly well. Just like the last few hours of this game, one, they're insane in terms of difficulty. The bosses, the last three major bosses that they throw at you are nuts. They are so creative. They are so demanding. They are so challenging and grueling. And I do think it is a criticism you could levy at the game that the normal default difficulty, and there's no slider at first, you have to beat the game to up it, and there's no lower, is ridiculously hard, huh. especially compared to other Metroid games. Like, you know how Metroid, the health, it's not, you know, in, in Zelda you have hearts, but in Metroid you have the energy tanks, and each one has 99 hit point, or yeah, health yeah. points. There are enemies who will just, with one hit, take out like five tanks of health. Oh, Jesus. You know, you can die in a couple of hits in one of these boss fights, and that's on the normal difficulty. Now, I have played a lot of Metroid, and this game, like, I think has a lot of tools to help you be good at it. So, I was able to get through it, even though a lot of the bosses I had to play over and over again. Which I was fine with, because I think it's fun, and that's part of the way bosses like this and this kind of game are designed, is you have to learn their patterns and stuff. I would just warn, while overall I think Metroid Samus Returns, if you've never played a Metroid, absolutely, this is a great introduction to the series. With the asterisk that it is really hard, and there probably should be an option on there... For like a uh, like, if this is normal, there should be an easy, right. especially for kids or first time players, because it's really brutally difficult. Um, and I I played it through again in the more brutally difficult mode and still had fun with it. So that's that didn't ever take away from the fun for me, but it's just worth knowing. Yeah, difficulty options are nice. People, yes. you should put them in unless you have a very good, compelling reason why it shouldn't be there. And it just actually surprised me a little bit because Nintendo has had this thing like since the mid days of the Wii where they've kind of really reveled in making very hard games in all their series. But that means they've added some options for kids and people who don't want to deal with that. Like, you know, there could be someone who helps you run through the level or there's right. an easy mode or something. And and I like that because, it, to me, like that frees Nintendo to go insane with their level design while also appealing to the wide audience. And I was just surprised that Samus Returns didn't have that. On the same hand, this game is... is it's, it's for the hardcore in some ways. Sure. Like, it is a love letter to Metroid and to the people who love it. Um, but the final hours of Samus Returns, you're getting through those bosses, it's hard. And then, like, once you've kind of beat the main part of the story, uh, or you're getting near the end game, so many cool things happen. Like, you know, this game sort of exists in a similar space as Metroid Zero Mission, in that it's a, it's a remake, but also a reimagining of an older Metroid game. And one of the things people always say about Zero Mission is, man, the ending is so surprising and cool and different. And that's absolutely true. Zero Mission, like, you basically beat what is the main playthrough of Metroid. And then there's a kind of, like, playable epilogue that happens that is so cool. And I'm not even... It's, it's like an 11-year-old game. I'm not going to spoil it. What they do there is amazing and awesome. And I think Metroid Samus Returns has something that is almost as cool and awesome mm -hmm. in how they, they kind of wrap up the story. Because if you... And I, I, I won't spoil exactly how they do it, but I'll just say... In the Metroid lore, you might know that the ending of Super Metroid involves that one last Metroid coming back and saving Samus, and it's a right. really great video game ending. And a lot of that is set up by the events of Metroid 2, and Samus Returns kind of takes our knowledge of where that goes and runs with it, and does so many cool things. And you leave that game on such a high. And the other reason is because when you're about ready to wrap up the game, 
this game is really accessible to completionists if you want to do a 100% run. Because I didn't just beat this game twice. I beat it twice with 100% completion. That means All I right. got every single item in the game. That's arguably neurotic. Arguably neurotic, but it was so much fun. Because, like, I have never gotten 100% completion in a Metroid game because they can be kind of tough, uh, especially right. on a first playthrough. And I've played most Metroid games just once. But... I really still love the act of going around and collecting. It's something I also love about the Zelda series. And I have done 100% runs on Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, Link Between Worlds. Like all the 2D ones right. with Link in the title, I guess, I've done. Um, I think I also did 100% on... Might have been The Wind Waker. Um, it, was, it was one of the 3D ones I played recently. I've definitely not done it on Ocarina of Time. Um, but I could have, I guess, at some point, maybe. But I do like doing that. And one of the great things about Samus Returns is it has a robust enough map system... And, like, enough little indications for you. It doesn't, like, play the game for you and that it just shows you, like, here's every single upgrade and what it is and how to get it. But it helps you, like, find all that information in the game. I got 100% twice. I never had to crack a walkthrough or anything online. I was just able to figure it out. And the process of going back through each zone and seeing, like, oh, now I have this power and I can use that here and I can get this item. And now I have to traverse over here and they've given me this thing with the screw attack or something and I can do that now. It's so much fun. And... Part of it is that this game has so many good upgrades. Like, if you like the process in a Metroid game of getting, you know, the new suits and the new abilities and all that stuff, Samus Returns has more upgrades than any Metroid game, and Samus feels so crazy powerful by the end, which is part of why I think the difficulty gets so steep near the end, is it would be easy to make the game too easy with how much Samus has to work with. Um, and and the part of the fun of doing your completion run and finishing it all near the end is you have all your abilities to work with and can just run around and, and kind of explore to your heart's content. And it's one of the great strengths of Samus Returns. It's got a really interesting structure where um, the game is very open and non-linear in that, you know, you basically just have this objective as you have to kill this many number of Metroids and you can kind of go where you need to to do that. But it's not one giant non-linear area. It winds up being a series of kind of cordoned off areas where like in area one, you have to get like three Metroids and then you'll open up another area. Now you have seven or something. And each one I think is a really good like microcosm of what 2D Metroid does so beautifully, which is this big open space and you just have to go explore it and find your way around it. And it's one of my favorite things in video games that a lot of other art mediums can't replicate is that feeling of getting lost. Mm -hmm. And not getting lost in the frustrating sense, like, oh man, where the hell do I go in this game? But just wherever you go, you'll probably be rewarded with some piece of information, even if that information is, well, I can't go this way yet, but now I have a, I have a clue, you know, right. and I can go somewhere. And, and, you know, Metroid does this, Zelda does this, Zelda did that beautifully this year with Breath of the Wild, which is a huge open world exploration of that idea. But I think Samus Returns does it really well, and that kind of microcosm thing where it's a series of, like, these little open environments, I think is really smart because it gives you all of that, but it also gives you this constant hit of like putting all the pieces together and moving on. And so you get that rush and then you get to start it over again. And then, you know, near the end of the game, if you want to go back through, there's still things you won't have found in all of those areas. Right. So it's just, it's so, if you like that side of Metroid, this game is just, it's so great. It's like just the, the best drug in the world being injected straight into your veins. It's perfect, but it's Metroid. Okay. I love it. So anyway, so there's all of that. I beat the game. I was on such a high. Like, this game was so fucking good, and I had so much fun. And I just didn't want to stop playing it. Like, part of it is Samus Returns plays so fucking well. Like, maybe better than any other Metroid game 2D or 3D. Like, Samus's movement is so smooth. All of her abilities feel so, like, perfect to execute. You feel there's so many abilities you can use, but they all feel so intuitive and have all sorts of different uses throughout. It's just such a heavily playable, fun game that even after beating it, because it's not a heavily narrative game, it was like, I, I want to play more. Right. And the only way to play more is to start again. And I had the Metroid Amiibo, a little squishy guy, which means I could unlock Fusion Mode. Now, when you beat the game once, you get a Hard Mode. That's like the harder than Normal Mode, obviously. Um, but if you have an Amiibo, then you can unlock Fusion Mode, which is a step up from Hard Mode. And you also have the Fusion Suit from Metroid Fusion, which, as everyone knows, is the coolest looking Samus suit. Sure. Yellow and blue thing. And the version in Samus Returns looks fucking awesome awesome and is basically mercury steam doing an audition to remake metroid fusion at some point which i thought i never needed in my life i love metroid fusion but it's fine as a gba game if the suit will look that cool i'm up for it okay. anyway and in 3d you know it looked really neat but anyway um so you get the fusion suit when they say it's harder though they're not fucking around this is like actually early in the game is some of the hardest stuff because when you have like one or two tanks of energy pretty much any hit from anything will just kill you 
And you have to get really good at using all the abilities they give you to make it through. And just the basic traversal can be tough, let alone the actual boss fights. Um, but I had a lot of fun with it because you really have to master the game to get through this. It kind of feels like Halo on Legendary or something. Right. When you see like, you kind of realize combinations of tools at your disposal that you never would have thought of on an easier difficulty, even as hard as the normal mode is. So um, I, I thought Fusion Mode was a blast. And I really started playing it just to kind of dick around and see what it was like. And I just, I, before I knew it, I'd killed half the Metroids and was halfway through the game. And I'm like, I'm just going to play the game again. It is so good. And I just got lost in it again. And normally, by the end of a second playthrough like that, so close after, I would feel some fatigue. I did not. I, I just was completely obsessed with this game two times through. And I was trying to rack my brain, like, what's the last time I did this? And it would probably be Doom from last year, yeah. which I did play two times through back to back. But... I also, like, I didn't 100% Doom two times through back-to-back. -back. I did the second run so I could go back and get all the trophies and stuff. Metroid, I just completely binged, like, obsessively, neurotically twice in a row. And that should tell you how good this game is. If you have any love for the Metroid series or any interest in it, this is an absolute must-play game. It is so good on just about every level. One of my favorite games of the year, and... This and Fire Emblem Echoes being the two of the big 3DS games this year is amazing because I don't know which one is better, but they're possibly like the two best games released on the system. And it's it's the 3DS is still cooking. Because that's yeah. the other thing is that Metroid Samus Returns really proves to me that the 3DS is still a viable system. Not just because the 3D in the game is really cool, which it is and I talked about last time, but also there's something about playing this game on a handheld like this with the two screens, which makes all the map and collection stuff really nice and convenient because you don't have to pause and look around. You can often just glance down and see where you're going, which I've always loved about the DS. But also I think there's something about 2D Metroid and that experience that having it just intimate in your hands, kind of like you're reading a book, feels really good. Because sure. there's so much atmosphere and you have that, the 3D, your headphones on. It would be cool to have this game on Switch and put it up on the big TV. I might argue it would lose a little bit of its magic. And, and I'm someone who really loves portable gaming, even if I'm not taking it outside of the house. Sometimes it's nice just to curl up in a chair you wouldn't normally play a game in and play that and have it be this really intimate experience. And I think Metroid, the Fire Emblems, a lot of these are, are really good examples of that. Um, and, and, you know, I, I like that the Switch, you can do that just for that experience, you know, taking it into another room, let alone taking it outside of the house. But I do think, like, Samus Returns makes great use of the 3DS and... Um, I don't remember if I joked about this on the air last week or not, but we got Fire Emblem Echoes, which is a remake of Fire Emblem Gaiden, which is yep. like the Black Sheep Fire Emblem sequel. We got Metroid Samus Returns, great reimagining of the Black Sheep Metroid sequel, Metroid 2. We clearly need a 3DS remake of Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, right? Yes, we do, yeah. It could be so cool if they did it with like this level of care and imagination, and I think the 3DS would be perfect for it. But, yeah, the 3DS is not going gently into that good night. No, it, it is sticking around. It's sticking around. We're going to get Persona Q at some point. Persona Q 2. Right. So we've got more Persona games coming to it. going to be more Persona games on this than there is on the PS4 right now. Well, eventually we're going to have the two dancing games. Yes. So there you yeah. go. But yeah, it's insane. All right. Do uh, you have any Metroid thoughts? No, it's been a long time since I played any Metroid stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been a long time since a new one was released. So. That's true. Yeah. 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 No. That's when do you think, because obviously they're working on Metroid Prime 4, but do you think they'll ever make another 2D Metroid game? You know, this one apparently has sold pretty well and has had a lot of positive reception. I would, Mercury Steam, the developers on this, I mean, it was co-developed with a lot of Nintendo people, as they tend to do with this. Hit this so far out of the park, if they're not looking at the sales and like maybe thinking about gearing that team up for either... I don't. They could do a fusion remake, and that could be interesting. I would love them to go on and basically do what would be Metroid Five, because sure. you have Metroid One, Two, Super Metroid, and Fusion. And Fusion at the beginning actually says Metroid Four. I would love to see like Metroid Five, like a two D game, because Fusion is so far the furthest point in the timeline. Go on from that. I think that could be really cool. What about this? What if they made Metroid the Other or M? <laughs> I don't think they're going to do that. Okay. I mean, it's just I'm just putting that idea out there. You know. Yeah. I think if you're going to like keep on pushing the Metroid franchise into the future. I just I do love Metroid came back with something this good. Hopefully bodes well for Metroid Prime 4. We still don't know who's working on it. Right, but I, yeah. assume, I assume Nintendo will get good people we on it. We know they have a logo for it. And that's reassuring. That is very reassuring. We don't have the full title. Because 2 and 3 both have subtitles. So I want to know what Metroid Prime 4 is. The, the, I already told you. The other are in. Oh, we're, we're there. All right. Well, anyway. Sean, uh, Destiny 2. Yes. I don't know how much we have to say. But I wanted to yeah. do a check-in. 
What have you been noticing with the game this last week? What's piqued your attention? Any complaints? More praise? I don't know. We, we talked yeah. a lot about it last time. Yeah. Like, I, honestly, I don't think my thoughts are very different because I think it's it's basically kind of like I've just been doing kind of the same stuff of I still think, like, the strike playlist needs to be have better rewards and stuff like that. I think, like, they just haven't found a good spot for that, how that fits in next to Crucible and, like, the harder, like, Nightfall Raid stuff and then, like, the more, like, sort of casual public event just like go fuck around on the planet stuff I feel like there's a there is a niche there for the strikes to fill and they haven't quite structured enough around there for it to fully fit in there i still enjoy doing the strikes because i think they're fun but it, there's something that kind of nags at you of like it this doesn't feel like it's fitting in to like my larger plan for my character or whatever the way that everything else does easier um, but I really am liking Crucible a lot. I've been playing a lot of Crucible, which is Crucible something that's so good. Like I barely ever played Crucible in Destiny One past the first week or so in this like and even then in that first week I just like kinda of dabbled in it and then eventually kind of fell away from it. And in this I'm really enjoying it. I think there's a lot more nuance there. Um and it's just it feels like a more competitive shooter that is interesting because it also feels very different than the other competitive shooters on the market, even like different than like the classic bungee halos this has a very specific flow to a match and i think like having to coordinate with a team even just like if you're not like talking to them but just like knowing how your team is moving around the map and knowing where to go yourself to help the team like i think there are i'm like getting a good sense of like strategies on how to play the game in that sense that i think it really is really interesting and i like that a lot I think Crucible is the best part of the end game. I think it's outstanding. Yeah. I think it gets better with each passing day. And you can just tell that I think as the player base gets to know it better yeah. and gets more experience with it, it's getting better. And sometimes that's the opposite. So it's really good that it's like, I. it's amazing how many matches I've had in Crucible where it is really close. Like you're getting yeah. down to the wire and like we've been trading the lead the whole time. That very rarely happens in online multiplayer shooters like this. So that's really cool that I think they've really, you can tell the balance is very finely honed when it feels that competitive. It's very rarely a route one way or the other. Yeah. I've even started doing more of the competitive playlist. I do it, I'm kind of wary of it because that has one game mode in competitive that I very much don't like, which is the, the charge one that you have to go set, the charges. Oh, right, yeah. And the, that one has a ton of weird problems where like, you, you can win by going and setting a charge, but it's also a survival mode where once you're all wiped out, you're done. Yeah, it's basically that, like the set the bomb mode from Counter-Strike. Yeah, but like I don't think I've ever gotten through that one way or another win or lose where it ends with the bomb going off. It's always just the, the team dies. It's, yeah. Cause it's, and like it's really fast. It's really brutal. Like it just – it feels very off to me. But on the other hand, the survival mode, which is, which is a one where you have a limited number of revives, but it's more forgiving – that one's really good, and I've had some great matches in yeah, that. Yeah, me too. So, but all of it I like. I like the challenges they've been doing every day. They're much better than the Crucible challenges from Destiny 1. Yeah, I also, yeah, I think they're the, how those challenges sort of replace the, um, God, what were they even called? Like the, basically challenges in, in from Destiny 1 of the, like, you, you know, you'd go to the bounties. That's what they yeah, were called, bounties, the bounty tracker. Yeah. And you just, like, pick up either these PV uh, bounties or these PVP ones. And those were, like, fine, but, like, there were, like, ten of them, you know, that's like, oh, get 30 melee kills without dying. Like, get 25 precision kills. Get, till, kill ten Vex majors. And then there were, like, those are all the PvE ones because I play more PvE. But there was, like, equivalent, like, PvP ones that's like, these are the, the same ones over and over and again. And the PvP ones were ridiculous. Yeah. Often. Like, they were like, well, I'm never going to do that. Like, yeah. that's just... Yeah, so, so no, I, I've liked them. I do, well, talking about that, like a UI thing, is the challenges, I love them. I love the whole challenge system that they're just automatically there and you can track them very easily. It sucks that the only way to see them is to bring up Ghost. Yeah. Because oftentimes, if there's anything in the right-hand corner of your screen, you can't bring it up. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely something that's going to be patched at yeah. some point. Especially, like, the thing that's the most ridiculous is if you have, like, a glimmer uh -huh. thing. This is just, like, tiny, barely even notice marker on the screen that like you don't even need to notice because who gives a fuck i got some glimmer or gray yeah like that will make it so that the challenge thing does not pop up and more importantly i want to be able to see the challenges from the destination tracker from the, sure, the guide yeah, yeah. because like oftentimes i'll go into crucible you don't know the challenges until you start a match but i need to set like what weapon i'm going to use what class i'm going to use and that's often decided by the challenges yeah so yeah. I just wish you, again, that's an easily fixable yeah, problem. That's something I imagine they're going to like patch within yeah. a month. That is like, because yeah. those are two pretty obvious things. But like, but with that, like the challenges, 
the thing I one thing I do love about them because it's both true of like the strike ones and the um, crucible ones in particular is that they do have a level of specificity to them that the bounty ones never had in Destiny One. So it does force you to like actually substantively change the way you're playing, and it will make me be like, oh, like. You know, I usually don't use my gunslinger class that much because I'm playing the hunter. But I have a, like, you know, get these many kills with, like, the golden gun in a strike. I'll switch to that yeah. and kind of change my gear around and play around it. And it's a good way to sort of force you to change your habits a little bit and make you realize, oh, wait, this is a really fun way to play this game. Because I think all the subclass like, yeah, types I are really good. But, like, sometimes... You know, I get like stuck in my like. Well, this is the best configuration for this exotic I have. So I had just been playing as the Night Stalker for a really long time, and I was like, "Oh, right, I barely touched the Gunslinger. This is a really awesome way to play this game." I agree completely. Uh, like I had not been using my Void class much, which is the first one you get as a Titan, and that's the Captain America shield one where yeah. you can fling it everywhere. I just hadn't used it much because I thought the other two were more useful. I now use it because um, some of the, the the challenges on the planets, and then in Crucible actually made me use it a few times. I started to really love it, and now like the one I use least is the Arc one, but I like to switch between the Void and the Sun one, but I still like the Arc one. So like yeah. I've really learned to like different gun configurations and things, so yeah. So all that's great. Um, the Strike playlist is dead to me for the moment, because yeah, you don't yeah. get shit for it, and the only two Strikes I ever fucking see, and I'm serious, I have not seen a different Strike other than these two since we last talked, the Inverted Spire or Exodus Black. Inverted Spire is fun, I don't like the Exodus Black one, and those are the only two I see. And it's really frustrating, so I stopped. I don't playing. think I've even seen the inverted spire yet. I think I've done all okay. of them except for although I, because that's the one from the beta, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that in the beta. I haven't had that come out with the strike. I, I really season. wish they had an option on the planets to like pick a strike you want to go play, like just because they're all at the same level in the playlist. Just yeah. break them out, and you could go do that. And maybe you have longer wait times, but it would be cool if that was an option because you could also bring your fire team into it and do it. Yeah, because it's also just a weird thing of like it's hard to know. If I've done all the strikes and stuff, or yeah. like, like I, I do kind of miss having some of that. Even though, like, is in Destiny One, you only ever did that once, even if you did it at all. Of well, like but that's picking the, the specific strike. Well, but the, one of the problems with that though is in Destiny One, they were at a much lower level on the planets. Yeah. Here, you could just you don't get the strikes until the end game, so they're yeah. at a certain level to begin with, and you could even from that like toggle a difficulty or something. Like, I think you could make that work. Yeah, because I think also what you could do is have that, so you could pick that specific one. But then you could also just get matched with people who have picked the, like, just give me any strike, like, yeah. mega playlist, and there's no reason why you couldn't be matched with them, and they just end up in that strike. Absolutely, yeah. I think, and I wouldn't be surprised if that gets added someday. Uh, the other thing is, so I did, I managed, Thomas and I managed to beat the Nightfall Strike last week, which was, okay, I guess I have played a different one. This was not Exodus Black, or, the, no, it was the Inverted Spire. It was the Inverted Spire. So that's why I mean, this is the only two I've seen. But, so we managed to beat that one. And I did break a part of a controller. Okay. Um, Jeez. Because it was super fucking frustrating. It was only the two of us because there's no matchmaking on the Nightfall. And it just like... Tom I, didn't, I don't really like that kind of thing to begin with. Thomas really wanted to play it. And I was the one he could play it with. So I was like, I'll beat it with him for him. I don't really like that super hard Destiny stuff. I'm just not into it. But like, it just it got so frustrating at some points. Because basically it was you took a hit or two and you're down... And by the time of the final boss fight, I was mostly just dead all the time and, and waiting to revive. And you have to wait forever to revive. It's a bunch of issues. And so I did throw my controller at one point and the, um, the, the battery casing thing broke like the, and it couldn't go back in. Luckily, nice. I did have a defective Xbox One controller that I had. It was the first one I ever owned. And so I just took the thing off. But that part of it was still working, so I just swapped them. I, I love that it's really that's it's one of the things of like I have a very like personal life philosophy of never dispose of electronics or yeah. like wires in any way because you never know yeah you never know it's like I might need this weird extra Xbox 360 controller that is mostly busted but like someday who knows yeah this was one I had gotten used early it was actually before I even owned an Xbox One I bought it used at like a GameStop or something to play Halo with Thomas on his Xbox One ah. and a few months in the um. Like the stick just came off, like it's just it's loose, like it's there, but it just is like, but it has flaccid. like no tension in yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So that I don't know what happened, but I've kept it and I was able to swap those parts, so it's all good. So there we go, but I shouldn't have thrown my controller anyway, no, yeah, because I also like you're an adult, Jonathan. I had like a, I have like, I, I have like my couch is like a futon, it's got like a yeah. wooden thing, like a wooden armrest, and I just slammed it on that, and it made a, it made a crunch. I knew before I, <laughs> before I looked at it, anyway, I was very. Job. 
It was it was also that might have been after we recorded the last podcast, so I was super tired to begin with, and he had I don't remember, but it was like I did not want to do that, and I did it, and I shouldn't have. It sounds like that's but not I do, the game's fault. Yeah, no, I do though with the Nightfall. I want someone to explain to me why the Nightfall can't have matchmaking. Yeah, I mean, it's, it has the guided games thing, which is like kind of matchmaking. I haven't yeah, done it, but, but it's not. Yeah, like <laughs> the raid, I get. It, I, I think at a certain point they could let us make our own goddamn decisions about what's good and not with the game sure. we paid to play. But with the raid, whatever. With the n- Nightfall, like Thomas and I were saying the whole time, if we just had a third person, he could be an idiot and not in communication with us, and this would be a breeze because we're actually doing okay. We're dying a lot, but we're doing okay with yeah. two of us. Like, it'd be fine. That There's something like... And I'm a little surprised that Activision isn't making them... Make some of this more user friendly. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Bungie has some stick up their butt about this, some philosophical thing. I'm surprised Activision hasn't come and said, you know, this game like sold like three million people. You gotta have matchmaking, and like we get the raid, we won't argue about it, but like make it easier for people to play. Sure, I'm just surprised yeah. that that's never come down from on high, because it's it's at a certain point in some of these things it's ridiculous. Like, I will agree with you for the nightfall. Like, I think like with the raid, there are a lot of concerns with like how then that would like affect them having to like change the way they designed the raid to make it accommodate matchmaking because then like there's a lot yeah. of stuff in there i totally i basically agree with their choice with the raid like i think matchmaking. guided games is a great solution yeah, for the raid yeah, it's a good compromise i don't think for, for the nightfall that's just unnecessary. yeah i agree like i just don't think the nightfall stuff i haven't done the nightfall stuff in destiny 2 yet but based on destiny yeah. 1 i don't think it was like it was definitely hard but not so hard that you needed like that level of yeah. team coordination I also, which is the actual concern with like not with yeah. matchmaking or not matchmaking i shall say i don't like how they do the nightfalls in destiny 2 it's like there's this whole timer thing and you have to jump through hoops literally because there's rings like superman 64 to get extra time and it's just you would I think not invoke that name so lightly sorry. had you played the game <laughs> but it's just i i don't i i think it's cuz i actually really enjoyed the nightfalls when i got to do them in destiny 1 they were they felt like a fair Heavier, like a legendary on Halo or something. Sure, yeah. This this is, I think, kind of gimmicky bullshit, so I don't like that. But yeah, um, you know, I've enjoyed other parts of the game. I still think, like, some of the milestones, they need to get some more in there to give you more things to do each day. Yeah, I really wish there was a daily heroic mission. Like, yes. I missed that um, most of all. Like, because yeah. that was just a really good thing of if you wanted to load up Destiny and play it for, like, 30 to 40 minutes. That was a good way to just, like, I'm just going to, like, dump into this. Play this mission on my own, kind of like zone out. Yeah, it allowed them to do like harder versions of the campaign missions, and I liked that as well. And I think like that's just a, like a big hole uh-huh. of, that like there should be something there. Like you should there should yeah. be a bigger incentive and like something more for you if you want to go play the old yeah. missions. And I think the Daily Heroic was a good version of that. Oh, yeah, I agree absolutely. Um, Destiny Two still really good. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's like compared to where Destiny One was at this point in its yeah, life. Yeah, when it came out, like fucking light years ahead. Yes, and it's the kind of thing of like, like I said last week on the podcast, every game that is like this starts out and has a bad end game. Like that's not like it's, like Diablo Two got it with the Lord of Destruction expansion. Diablo Three got it with like Reaper of Souls. World of Warcraft got it after like a year or two of it being out. Like you know, that's like every MMO goes through that. Right, it's something you have to like. Every single MMO or loot-based kind of like multiplayer-focused game has had the same exact life cycle of anyone that's successful so that people get to the end and then bitch about the end game until yeah. the end game is really good and then they bitch about how the game is too easy for everybody and it's like, it was a real game back when it took me like five months of my life to get to level 60 in World of Warcraft and now these kids, it only takes them two and they get a fucking mount at level 20. What the fuck? It's a weird thing where, you know, this time three years ago with Destiny 1, I was more obsessed with Destiny but I would say my... But you were, like, angry about it. Yes. But in, with Destiny 2, I am I have a healthy relationship with yeah, Destiny. I remember, I I remember right. you having, like, a problem with Destiny. Uh, yeah. I played a lot. Ago. I played yeah. a lot. I don't even have access to that version of the game anymore because I play on Xbox now. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway. Cross-platform play. I'd also love that at some point. Sure. I think you could do that with Xbox. Well, we know they could, but Sony doesn't want to. Yeah, <laughs> that's the yeah. Until there's like, until Sony gets a like economic reason to do it, they're not going to do it. And then it's the no. same. We were in the exact same boat with Microsoft last generation, where they didn't want to do it. It's it'll never happen. All right. Well, anyway, uh, last thing on the show today, Sean. Next time we talk, it will be October. It will. Um, yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah, I'm the turning slow march of time. I'm turning twenty five. And I'm just sad about that. I don't know. It just that's 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 a quarter of the way to 100. That's fucked up. 
You know, sure. that's what, yeah, you can <laughs> slice that cake a lot of different ways. That's the best way you choose to slice it. Anyway, but let's go quickly through what are the games coming out in October. I have my calendar, and if I've forgotten any, you can let me know. Okay. But it's a crazy month. It is. It's not that there's like a hundred games, but the ones that are coming out, it's a dense month. Yeah. So let's quickly, end of September, uh, this Friday the 29th, we're getting the SNES class, which we mentioned earlier, and Cuphead, which I'm right. excited to finally right. check out. That game's actually coming out. Yeah. Uh, on Xbox, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm probably unless like it gets really terrible reviews or something. I do, I'm very curious about Cuphead yeah. because I feel like wasn't that game announced like the same year as No Man's Sky? It's Basically, been like it was like 2014 or 13. It might have yeah. been 2013. Like it's been a long time. I am at the very least very excited to watch YouTube videos of that game, even if you know yeah. if it's bad and you don't want to play it. The animation it at least looks fucking awesome. It does absolutely. Uh, let's see. So for October, October 6th, we're getting Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga plus Bowser's Minions over on the 3DS. Right. Which I'm looking forward to. Uh, on October 13th, we're getting The Evil Within 2. Right, yeah. Which I would really love to play, but I haven't played Evil Within 1, and I won't have time. Yeah, that for me is a very much like, I, like, you, like I'd like to play it. Um, it seems like it would be such a let's play game. Like, I think I'm just going to end up seeing it in some let's play at some <laughs> point. Probably without yeah. even really attending to it. It just happens. October 17th is a game I kept forgetting was coming out, but also for the 3DS is Etrian Odyssey 5. Right. Which I could have, like, I'm not going to have time to play. I wish I did because they did put out a demo and it looks amazing. The music is awesome and has a bunch of saxophones. That's cool. October 20th is Fire Emblem Warriors for the Nintendo yeah, Switch. Now with Lindis. Now with Lindis. So, so there's a good reason to get it. I'm excited for this game. I'll only have like seven days to play it, but I am excited for this game. You uh, should you should get it when it comes out and just wait and get it like in fucking December or something. I want the special edition. Can, if you know what, if I don't have time to finish it, I can put it on the shelf okay. and come back to it. Uh, October twenty seventh is D Day. Yeah, we have this is the one. Wolfenstein two, yeah, the new I'm Colossus playing that. on PS four. Assassin's Creed Origins. I'm fascinated by that game. I really want to play it. Yeah, I very don't much have a, like to play it. I haven't put a pre order down yet because I just don't know what to do. Yeah. And October t- uh, also we have Super Mario Odyssey on the Switch, uh-huh. which will be my obsession. Yeah, I, I'm, it's one of those things that like I'm weirdly glad I don't have a Switch, just so it's like I don't have to worry about it right now. I don't have like it's like if I ever get a Switch, I can cr- fucking cross that bridge when I come to it. But there's too many fucking games because again, I have games I've already bought like Neo that I haven't even started playing yet this yeah. year. So, did I forget anything else from October? Um, I'm it's not a sure. big month no. for Nintendo. Yeah, because because Call of Duty is not until early November, yep. right? So, yeah, yeah, that fucking October twenty seventh, that like three hit. That's fucking just because I'm one hundred percent like Wolfenstein two is my pre order okay. priority out of those three, and S- Super Mario is my pre order yeah. priority. And we both probably want to play Assassin's Creed. Yes, like I might pick it up the same day with Mario just to get the discount. Yeah, and try to get to it later, but I like, I'm I'm like waiting for the reviews on sure, that. Sure, yeah, because I think there's like a decent chance that that game's not that good, but I think there's also a decent chance that that game is really good or at least like really fascinating. And it's, yeah. it's the you know it's the most interested I've been in an Assassin's Creed game for a while, and I have my weird yeah I've got my weird Assassin's Creed thing, and I feel obligated to check in on it every now and then. So what else in October? Is there anything else you're going to be playing that month? I have a lot. It's yeah. a it's the biggest one for me. It's a big one for you. Just, yeah, you've got all the Nintendo stuff. Like I think I, I'm actually going to use some of that time to catch up yeah. on. I want to play, put more time into No Man's Sky because what I've played of it so far is really interesting. I need to get started on Neo. Uh, I need to play through Hellblade. I would like to play Resident Evil Seven at some point. In, like, and there will October. definitely be a discount this yes, month. Yes, in October is when it would happen. So if I could Resident get, Evil Seven, you could probably play on a weekend. Yeah, that seems like that's a pretty quick one. Like same thing with Hellblade. I just have to get around and like yeah. do it. Man, yeah. so so yeah, the big catch up game I still have is I have Horizon Zero Dawn sitting on yeah. my PS4. I, I think it's a lost cause. I don't think I'm getting to it this year. We'll see. I don't know, <laughs> but it's there's a lot. I I do want someone at Nintendo to explain to me why Fire Emblem Warriors is coming out seven days before it's Mario. It's so just it's such a fucking bad spot for that game. That's one of those games that's like you can put it out anywhere. Yeah, you don't need to compete in this f- fucking fuck fest that is October. Go somewhere else. Go to like late November, or early December. Like yeah. wait until like early next year in January. If put it somewhere else. If that game was the first week of December, I'd be so excited for it. Yeah, it's like like you know like Yakuza Zero and Gravity Rush Two earlier this year. Yeah, or like yeah. even like Horizon. Like they had in Resident Evil Seven. Like they had like January and February. Those four games had them completely to themselves. It's like can you imagine if Yakuza Zero and Gravity Rush Two had come out in fucking like this October? 
I would have never played either of those games. Yeah, I... You know, it's it's a weird thing, and <laughs> I'm gonna again. I want to play it. It's it's the Switch, so like you know, being able to take it around and stuff like that makes it a little easier to multitask with games like that. It's just that the fact that the very next game coming out is also the Switch. Uh huh. So you know, I, I think I can probably like clear the campaign in that in a week, and then I can play Mario and come back to Warriors for other stuff eventually. Sure. But I don't know. Warriors also already has a full DLC slate announced because true. Yeah. I know. mean, because it's it's a it's a Musou game, so yeah. It's got to have all the weird costumes. Did you hear? Shit. I read an interesting story about Dynasty Warriors Nine, which is coming out next year. It has like uh-huh. a fully playable version of China in it. Like yeah, it's, like it's going oh. open world and all yeah. this crazy shit. Looks yeah. really cool. Uh huh. So I'm glad. It sounds I'll, like we're going to be getting that. So I'll, somehow I'll guess I'll play that. I guess I'm the guy who plays those games now. That just happened. I'll play it too if I like the, this sure. Fire Emblem one because yeah. it's it's a Musou game. But yeah. Uh, that's October. That's how we're going to divide and conquer that. Yeah. Um, again, I would like to, to, in that early part of October, eat into some of my backlog. We'll see how well that actually goes. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Um, thank you, guys. I think this was a really fun podcast. Yeah, we got to talk about a lot of stuff. We got we got a big topic off our chest. Yeah. You know, the N64 classic. Like, that was just, like, burning a hole in my heart. I know. There were highs. There were lows. This is the loosest podcast we've done in months, and I actually like that. It feels like it's a nice way to unwind after, like, like Twin Peaks The Return so took over this podcast for such a long time. I mean, we, we've it's talked like, about... It's like, it's liberating to take it back. We've talked about this a lot off the air. This year was Persona 5 into Doctor Who into Twin Peaks with overlap on all of those, and that just meant that we were very rigid in what we had to talk about each week. And it's, I don't know, this was nice. Yeah, we just get to talk about whatever the fuck we want to talk about. If we want to talk about Agent Cody Banks and Spy Kids, like, that's, welcome to next week on the podcast. Next week on the podcast, Agent Cody Banks 2, Destination London, co-starring Anthony Anderson, is going to be our watch of the week. How do you remember <laughs> so much about that movie? That you can actify, like, identify any actor in that movie other than fucking Frankie Muniz. What is wrong with you? 